Okay, welcome to the third day of SC4 2020. So our first speaker of the day is Subramania Hegre and he will tell us about supergravity. Over to you, Subramania. Okay, uh, so firstly, something I should have asked earlier, should I turn on the video or because of the early signs, should I keep the video off? Um, I think uh, because you have already undergone some trouble in the you know, yeah. last Okay, few let's days. keep it off. Let's yeah. keep it off, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'll do a recap of whatever we have done so far. So first we studied Clifford algebra and spins. And our central goal in this part of the discussion was to construct the minimal spinner in four dimensions. Okay. And that had the condition that uh, uh, i psi dagger gamma zero is equal to psi bar, which is psi transpose C. Okay. Where C is the matrix, which has this problem. All right. And along with this, we needed that T1 is minus one. And we saw that there are two, two such charge conjugation matrices in four dimensions. And one of them satisfied this condition. And we took that matrix to be the charge conjugation matrix to define Marana space. Okay. So these, these conditions are called as the Marana condition. Okay. In fact, it is both of these. Okay. It's called Marana condition. Okay, there is a lag, it seems like. But, uh, yeah, let's see. So now, uh, okay. So after that, we went to su supersymmetry algebra. So why you think this is not a lag, but the screen is frozen? Ah, okay, yeah, that might be true. Stop broadcast. Yeah. Okay. I don't know why it is taking such time. Can you guys see the screen now or is it just... No, it shows that Not you have yet. started screen sharing. Okay. I think the Wi-Fi on your iPad is a bit uh, weak. Yeah, probably I should connect to the other Wi-Fi. Or is it possible to just connect the iPad to mobile? Mobile internet? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> mobile internet is also not good here. Ah, okay. Totally yeah, yeah. Yes, sorry. No, no, if you're sitting in the spring area, the mobile internet is almost non existent. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. That it's Prayag, that's it. Yeah. I mean, that even other, at other places, it's not that good. One second. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. So then we discuss supersymmetry. Okay. And supersymmetry algebra at this Q Q bar. Okay. With some indices. Uh, I don't remember which one I used. Let's say this cancel I gamma mu. Okay. So this was the supersymmetry algebra. And we studied representations of uh, this algebra. Of course, this algebra comes along with Poincaré algebra. Okay. And uh, we also had the commutator with M, maybe, and so on. Then we studied massless representations of SUSI. So we wrote it in a slightly different form. We went to the whale representation. Okay. And we studied only one uh, sector, which is, uh, let's say the chiral sector and the anti-chiral sector we obtained by CPT. And one thing that was, we were discussing yesterday where uh, like Anish and made some comments and we had some discussion, which is that we can look at it in uh, two ways, the way we dealt with the representations. Okay. One thing is that okay, particles, are irreps of 
पॉइंट कराया जाए ठीक है so this is a statement that you will find in for example weinberg quantum field theory okay and it's a very good definition of particles okay so now you know that for massless particles they they have this uh, uh, if you consider the standard momentum k bar k bar mu which is k 0 0 k then we will have k bar and h h not let us say where this is the helicity and there are two helicities and what we did is we considered the action of the of these of this algebra on these states okay and we found that in the whale representation q dagger j2 okay that acts as the uh, uh, that acts as the uh, creation operator okay and using this creation operators we uh, constructed the states right this one our states okay and another way to think about this okay about why this is happening why action of this okay and okay one more thing i need to mention is that once we did this we got states of different helicities right so we got a state which is i1 to im k bar which not minus n by okay and these correspond to different particles single particle states okay and one way to think about it is the fact that when you do this representation theory you can also do it in terms of poly lubanski oper lubanski operator right and that operator is a casimir of the poincare algebra so poincare algebra has two casimirs which is p square okay and the poly lubanski operator square okay and uh, and this operator is no longer a casimir okay once you consider the full super poincare algebra if it was a casimir it would have commuted with all these okay and the helicity would remain the same okay but because it is not a casimir we supersymmetry takes us to different particles okay so this is how we can understand why supersymmetry generators are taking us from one particle to another particle okay uh, is that okay anish is this what you wanted to say do you want to add something no no i i think this is fine this is fine Okay. Okay. So I think this is a nice way of explaining why supersymmetry mixes particles. Okay. And the full representation now is called as a multiplet. Okay. Which is a collection of particles which transform among each other under supersymmetry. Okay. And so we studied I, I various multiplet. Yeah. Yeah. So I I think what uh, Shubhranilda and Neetu were saying is that there exists a supersymmetric uh, Casimir. I mean, some not the Pauli Lewinsky uh, Casimir, but some other. Uh... Yeah, that might that might exist. So okay, for that I have uh, also I gave an answer in Slack, which is that when you consider single particle states for scattering, right? Then this state still holds true. Okay, we whatever we call as particles in quantum field theory are irreducible representations of Poincaré algebra. Okay, I mean, th this notion of like what is particle. was wait to me until i read weinberg uh, that chapter okay because like uh, you you could say particles have nothing inside them but we also call proton a particle right so particles are ultimately irreducible representations of the poincare algebra okay and what what the way we study quantum field theory is that we study irreducible representations of the poincare algebra and other symmetry representations over those uh, algebra over that algebra okay so supersymmetry mixes particles so when you consider super space okay this super casimir might become important okay but one because super space uh, which i am not discussing in this lectures is a language which makes supersymmetry manifest okay so there these kind of things become important but there one even if you write in super fields and you use the that technology once you compute Uh, a relevant quantity for scattering amplitudes okay you are always going to evaluate it in components okay because when whatever you are going to detect or whatever you call as scattering amplitudes ultimately have component fields okay? so when i say component supersymmetry throughout these lectures i mean these are these com these component fields are representations of the poincare algebra okay that is the statement is that okay 
so 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 let's just just yeah, make yeah, sure yeah. i understand uh, so what you are saying is that even though i can extend the poincare algebra with this uh, supersymmetry algebra i'll yeah. still use the uh, the casimir for poincare algebra to label the states or, or what i call particles yeah 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 but 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 for instance suppose when you have a, a conformal uh, symmetry yeah you label the states uh, using delta as well right not really see for example suppose you consider yang mills theory right in four dimensions okay yang mills theory is conformal in four dimensions right but when you study like when you study your basic quantum field theory course and compute scattering amplitudes you are only considering representations of the poincare algebra in your scattering amplitude okay so we are not we are not studying the representations of the conformal field theory when we study scattering amplitudes for that theory. okay thanks yeah so two people have raised hands yeah yeah ravi first yeah uh, can you hear me yeah yeah, yeah so uh, so not every supersymmetry could be embedded in terms of uh, a super space structure right uh, not every super symmetry uh, because we don't have uh, like a super space uh, def defined for all super symmetries yeah yeah but uh, i mean i don't know if that's like a technical obstruction or you know because like for example some uh, representations were not developed earlier which got developed later okay. but there is some issues like for example after n is equal to 4 super symmetry super symmetries are not off shell in like four dimensions every super symmetry is realized on shell and super super space as far as i know is an off shell approach so there are these obstructions yeah. so uh, if you are saying you want to write a casimir uh, super casimir sort of thing then is it mandatory that you have a super space representation as well or Um, oh, I don't know. What I'm saying is, whatever it is, it would be relevant if you consider if you try to make supersymmetry manifest. But okay. I'm not an expert in superspace. So. Okay. I was Madhu trying to make a comment earlier. I I heard some voice, but I didn't. Uh, no, I was just pointing out that uh, Ravi had a question. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, Ashwin. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh... Uh, i want to say that uh, you can actually construct this irreps of poincare from the little group uh, yeah right so right yeah uh, you can in fact uh, tell uh, that uh, the particles are uh, irreps of little group yeah basically what the little group does is it will it will con construct an induced representation of the poincare algebra like using yeah. the representations of the little group you will construct a little uh, uh, representation of the poincare algebra which is which i skipped and took as an input here yeah because that is done in qft so, yeah. yeah okay so uh, we studied the representations okay and then Uh, sorry, I had uh, one more question. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So in the previous slide, I mean, uh, yeah. so uh, uh, this is about this uh, uh, whether something is convention or not. So mm -hmm. you said the for T zero and I mean T R is generally fixed by T zero and uh, T one. Yes. Yes. And uh, uh, for uh, there were two possible choices for uh, the. Yeah. Conjugation, uh, yeah. Conjugation matrix C. Yeah. And uh, both of them had uh, T zero equal to one and uh, T one equal to plus uh, plus one and minus one. So. Yeah. I mean, in general, uh, you would have had uh, T zero equal to minus one as well, right? But. Uh, yeah. So, uh, is it that this T zero equal to minus one choice can actually uh, be? Uh, some some uh, similarity kind of transformation for the uh, c matrix meaning no so what happens is that given a dimension given a space time mm. dimension you can derive what should be uh, what should be t0 and t1 so there are dimensions where t0 is minus 1 so it ha that also happens okay it won't change with the representations yeah adrita is asking something 
please repeat the term within the square bracket in the last line of the slide, please. Oh, uh, sorry, I should have written a dagger. Do you mean this, do you mean this, Sadrata? I think on the right hand side, maybe. Oh, this W square. Uh, no, the right hand side of that equation. I want to I am. Yeah. I yeah. This oh, right hand side. Okay, okay. Yeah. So this this what we what we said last time is uh, or last to last time is that I one to I am uh, are indices because of this Q dagger I one and Q dagger I am because each creation operator. Uh, has an index, okay, and because these are Grassmann numbers, uh, they, whichever state is constructed, these uh, indices will be anti-symmetric, okay. So that is why this uh, bracket, uh, this bracket, square bracket notation. So any state which is in the Fox space, which is raised by this uh, uh, creation operators, has these indices as, as well. And we saw that Q dagger also. Uh, lowers helicity by half okay and if we act m of q daggers helicity is raised by minus m by by m by two okay is that okay uh, adrita is that clear yeah she yeah. says yes uh, mutusami Mutu. yeah, yeah. Subhu, can yeah. you go over the argument for the question that you had answered previously about whether we like what kind of uh, what do we call particles when conformal symmetry is also there? Is it still the irreps of the Poincare group? Or? Yeah, yeah. When you consider the S matrix of a theory, right? So when you do a scattering experiment, the single particle states are irreducible representations of the Poincare algorithm. So when you do like super conformal field theories, you would cons consider representations of the uh, conformal algebra. Okay. But uh, even though we have conformal symmetry in Young Mills, uh, pa single particle states for the S matrix are irreps of Poincaré because that is what we call as particles. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So then we went over to uh, HLS theorem. Okay. I don't remember how many points I had. Hopefully three. So HLS theorem. And HLS theorem to told us that if we have one conserved or any n conserved fermionic charge, right? Mahrana fermionic charge. If we have Dirac, then we saw that we could write it as two Mahrana charge. That implies an extended supersymmetry for that theory. We used it to show the supersymmetry invariance of super young mills using this, okay, for n is equal to one super young mills. And is there a question? And then we considered the issue of on shell versus off shell multiplets, okay, where off shell degrees of freedom were defined. And this is a very important concept for these lectures. It is the number of field components minus number of gauge transformation parameters. Someone is unmuted. Is there a question? Okay, this is not a minus. Subo? Yeah. On Q, you have uh, index 1 and 2, right? Yeah. I1 and I2. Uh, uh, 1 and 2 also, yeah. yeah. Those are fermionic indices, yeah. Okay. Uh, so those are uh, uh, those are the same in all dimensions. You have just two and one of them uh, happens um, to be unimportant. One of them happens to be unimportant. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, so I went to the whale representation, okay? I have not studied representations in greater than four dimensions, but uh, because usually we consider like, I mean, when we go to S matrix, we consider some dimensional representation, whatever I have studied. But I know that whale representation exists in every even dimension. Okay? 
and if you have let's say two two n uh, uh, cross two n matrix matrix which is the gamma mu. So here we had this sigma mu and sigma bar mu. So we had uh, two cross two matrices. Okay, but here we will have two n two uh, uh, n minus n n cross n right n cross n and n cross n uh, matrices. So here we have two cross two matrices, which is why we have like two uh, uh, operators. Okay. But there we will have uh, the set of operators. But uh, yeah, but I don't know if that was useful. I mean, but we will still have like two chiralities using this gamma phi. If we write, uh, it will still be one zero zero minus one. But I have not studied the representations in higher dimensions. Maybe someone else can know. Uh, they can tell. Okay. Yeah, can I say something? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, I think in any even dimension D, uh, the Y spinners are uh, D by two component vectors. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think. Components. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. This so two n is like D, right? So n is like D yeah. by two. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. what I mean. So for each fermionic charge, we expect just one of them uh, to act as a creation operator. Maybe actually, I I know very little about uh, the high dimensional representations because I have not even studied, for example, the uh, Lorentz Poincaré representations, like particle representations in high dimensions. So. I won't be able to comment much on this because you know, like it won't be like just two helicities. Okay. I mean, it won't. It won't at least be two helicities of in the same sense as four. So I don't. Like how to... Okay. Okay. So we define this off-shell uh, degrees of freedom. Okay. And whenever off-shell degrees of freedom match. Social algebra closes without demanding equations of motion. So what this tells us, okay, closes on the multiplet if you wish on the fees. Okay. What this tells is that transformation. is independent of uh, of the action this is always true in classical field theory right whereas here it became more non trivial for example if you have like a gauge field a non abelian gauge field mu mu a let us say okay we can use it to write any action for that field Okay, and that will be gauge. I mean, we can use it to write any gauge invariant action for that. Thing. We could write f mu trace f mu nu f mu nu. Okay, but we could also take a square of it, right? So we can write higher derivative actions, and the gauge transformation won't change. Whereas in supersymmetry, if you have one shell supersymmetry, which which is the one you can derive by massless representation theory, okay, the supersymmetry algebra algebra closes only up to equations of motion. Okay, this does not happen. For example, in non-abelian gauge theory, the algebra closes on fields. Period. Okay. So because this happens, okay, so the transformation rules will be dependent on that equations of motion. If if you consider super Young Mills with the action I wrote last time with f mu nu f mu nu and the uh, minimally coupled action uh, of the fermion, okay, then the transformation rule will be associated with that action. So if you want to write a higher derivative action for the same fields. Then you will have to modify both equations of motion and the transformation rule, and this becomes a very complicated iterative process. Okay, and this is why optical supersymmetry is useful. Are there any questions? Okay. 
so next we discussed an extended super conformal algebra okay this is the slide from last time okay. so an extended super conformal algebra we have people denoted by su2 2,2 uh, uh, slash n okay i i don't know actually how people pronounce it i have always used it in text okay and this su2,2 is so4,2 okay which is the conformal group in four dimensions which many of you might have studied in your cft courses or discussions okay and uh, n is the number of supercharges okay maharana supercharges so right maharana okay so this is the n extended super conformal algebra so what what are the members okay it has p which are translations mab which are lorentz transformation generators dilatation generators which is x scaling special conformal mm -hmm. transformation generators or conformal boost generators okay. and this is the usual supersymmetry generator so these the, these generators are anyway there because we are cons considering the conformal algebra and its supersymmetric extension and we discussed last time that if we take the commutator of k with q we get a new fermionic generator which is called as the special supersymmetry generator okay and further we also uh, we also discussed that there are these additional generators which is su nr cross u1 r generator which are necessarily there so that the jacobi identities are satisfied okay so uh, in the technical language that we were using in on slack these are called as inner automorphisms of the algebra in the sense that these are members of the algebra and uh, and also it is true that without them there is no algebra okay so uh, yeah uh, so, so if, if i have, have let's say n, n equals 1, one is it uh, super conformal algebra? algebra yeah yeah Uh, uh, so then, then it's just a u1 cross u1 or, or like, like uh, i mean so does the, like the additional things they change oh i see um okay actually i don't remember what happens for n equal to 1 i think there is a u1 u1 r symmetry i think muthu okay. or Madh madhu mishra if they know they can tell i don't remember i see okay okay, okay. i think arnab has a comment um uh, hi Yeah, actually, is a super conformal algebra. Does it close off shell or on shell? Is this voice breaking or is it just me? Okay, can you hear me now? Maybe okay, can okay. you just repeat the question? Or... Okay, I ah, I heard you. I heard. Okay, I understood the question anyway. Okay, so yeah, so we will discuss it on the fields. Okay, so because this uh, this question of whether an algebra closes on shell or or off shell. Okay. at this level uh, at this level it it does not matter in the sense that i will i will like today we means algebra to close off shell on on shell and because if you just consider these abstract generators there is no sense in which you can define this is true up to equations of motion right okay so when we consider abstract generators it is always closed okay the the algebra okay without any uh, equations of motion because they are not relevant here but when we realize it on fields okay we can generalize this notion and we can because the transformations on the fields also realize the algebra okay so when when that happens okay you can have this feature where it can close up to equations of motion or without equations of motion so when so since i am considering abstract generators here i can't make that uh, comment is that okay yes of course there are some comments on chat um, ah okay so boy doesn't it's about anish's the... question ah, yeah okay okay yeah. yeah i also have that opinion anish yeah so okay and this um, su su n uh, uh, symmetry it acts in this way okay where q uh, q upper j are like are in the fundamental representation and q lower j are in the anti fundamental representation okay and using this expression here okay uh, k comma q going to s okay we realize that because there is a gamma a q has chirality uh, minus 1 and 
and S has chirality plus one. Okay, so this also we realize. And also another thing which I had not covered in my earlier lectures, which I mentioned yesterday, is that because because this uh, uh, these spinners are Maharana, okay, so these charges are Maharana. The symmetries are chiral symmetries, okay, because if you just do a U1 transformation on Maharana spinners, right, then if psi goes to psi prime, which is e to the power i theta psi. Psi star will go as e to the power minus i theta psi star, okay. and Maharana condition relates psi and psi star. Okay. So this e to the power i theta terms won't cancel on both sides because they transform in the opposite way. Okay. So you can't couple Maharana fields to a normal u1 uh, uh, symmetry, okay. but they can have this chiral u1 symmetry, okay, where the chiral projections of the Maharana spinner will have opposite charges under that symmetry. So this is compatible with the Maharana spinner condition. Okay. Therefore, even in the superconformal algebra, these uh, generators of the uh, S U N and U one, they are chiral generators. Is that clear? Okay. Okay, so let me continue with the discussion of the superconformal algebra. We'll just do it for another 10 minutes and then we will go to conformal gravity and we will see how to obtain uh, conformal gravity for uh, point correct. Okay. And, uh, okay. Uh, sorry, one question. Uh, yeah. When you say not compatible, uh, you mean that if you uh, I mean, if you do this U1 transformation, it won't bind uh, major uh, There is no sense in which we can do so. For example, suppose I give you a real scalar field, right? Hmm. Then you know that you can't act by a U1 symmetry on a real scalar field because it won't remain real, yeah. right? So yeah. this is similar. So in yeah. some Bahirana condition is making the spinner real in some sense. Okay, because it is relating it to its complex conjugate. Therefore, you can't do a U1 symmetry. But here, it, the subtlety is that you can, however, do a chiral U1 symmetry. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the reason for being able to do chiral U1 symmetry is that, you know, we discussed that if you have psi bar L, that is equal to I psi dagger R uh, comma zero that left where psi is Marana spinner and psi L and psi R are its uh, chiral projections, right? Mm -hmm. And we, and this tells us that, this tells us that, uh, so, and this is a transpose, right? Psi L transpose C, okay? So if yeah. this transforms as e to the power I theta, okay? Then mm -hmm. if psi R transforms as e to the power minus I theta, because it is like, you know, anti-chiral, okay? Mm -hmm. Then the dagger will make it back to e to the power i theta and they will cancel on both sides. Okay. Mm -hmm. So therefore this is compatible, whereas this is not the usual u1 symmetry is not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so Madhu has answered, uh, Madhu and Muthu have answered Anish. That is good. Yeah. So uh, so now. Okay, uh, so all this is fine. Now, okay, so maybe I should mention, so this is a uh, convention, more like. Okay, so this is how, this is imaginary I. So this is how the Q transforms under uh, U1, okay. So where this half is a normalization factor. Yeah, and Madhu is saying for n is equal to 4, r symmetry is SC4, yeah, which I mentioned yesterday, yeah. But these are just facts from Nam's classification, okay? Like, I mean, you can go to Nam's paper and look it up or any reference on supergraph. Okay, so TQI is uh, I by 2QI and uh, TSI is also I by 2SI. Okay. That is because we saw this 
relation between k q and s right now k does not transform under uh, k does not have any non trivial commutator with t okay? and therefore so since k does not have any charge and if q has some charge uh, uh, s has the uh, that charge so okay and uh, if you now if you work out uh, this thing Q i q bar j. Okay, sorry, I don't know why I wrote it. Okay, nice. Sorry. Okay, so now what what we need to understand is we also have dilatation symmetry. Okay, so how do these uh, operators change under dilatation symmetry? Okay, uh, so then uh, we have this commutator d q i is w of q. I. Okay, where well, W is some uh, uh, number which will be fixed soon. Okay, so you know this was a convention. So one might think that W is also a convention, uh, but if you take this, sorry, if you take this. Jacobi identity. Okay, if you take this Jacobi identity, okay, uh, then you know uh, DQI. We know d q bar j. We know because that is just uh, taking a bar of this whole thing, okay. Uh, and uh, q q bar we know, okay. And q q bar goes to p and d p we know. D p goes as uh, p, okay. D comma p a is p a in uh, or minus p. I don't remember p. Okay. D comma p is p in uh, conformal algebra, right? So that is what fixes this veil weight. Okay, it will tell you that W is half, and we call this the veil weight. Okay, because it is it is the uh, it is the scaling under uh, the dilatation transformation. Okay, so another simple way to see it is that Q Q closes to P, right? So if P has veil weight, so veil weight is just how P transforms under dilatation. And transformation of p under dilatation is given by its commutator with dilatation operator, which is given by this commutator. Okay, so its veil weight is one. Okay, and therefore, uh, if uh, so, the veil weight of this is one. Therefore, if q q closes to p, the veil weight of q and q bar better be half. Okay, so that explains this half. And if you do another Jacobi identity, okay, Jacobi identity of uh, Jacobi identity of uh, uh, D uh, K and Q, okay, Jacobi identity, will imply that S has weight weight. Uh, minus half. Okay, this is because k q closes to s, right? But k has the uh, opposite uh, veil weight as p. Okay? D comma k a is minus k. Okay, that is what gives s i to be veil weight minus half. And this veil weight is not changed by raising and lowering this index, right? Remember, q lower i and q upper i. Are and similarly s lower i and s upper i are anti-fundamental and fundamental representation of the SU and algebra given here. Okay, so but but uh, what is true is that uh, going from one to the other will not change the veil weight. Okay, so in fact you can go from one to the other by Hermitian conjugation. Okay, some by some 
process related to Hermitian conjugation because if one is chiral, another is anti-chiral, right? That also uh, we can check. That is how we define Q upper I and Q lower I, right? If Q upper I is anti-chiral, Q lower I is chiral, okay? So therefore, by this uh, relation that I wrote here, you can go from one to the other, okay? So therefore, her Hermitian conjugation in some way relates the upper indices to lower indices, okay? This will always be true. In, uh, in throughout our lectures, okay? Complex conjugation of the bosons and Hermitian conjugation of the fermions will take us from fundamental to anti-fundamental representation. It will also change the uh, charge under U1, okay, which we will call a chiral weight, okay? but it won't change the uh, scaling under dilatation, which we call as the weight. So the important concepts are that we have a new special SUSI Okay. There is chiral weight, okay. which is uh, uh, chiral weight, which is okay. just check here, which is half for QI, okay. half for QI minus half for SI. Okay. The additional I factor is because uh, you know, this is a U1 transformation, so it will be IQ times the field. Okay? So IQ theta times the field. Okay? So, and there's whale weight. Okay, for QI, uh, whale weight is half, and for SI, whale weight is minus. Is that okay? Are there any questions? Uh, I, yes, I, I do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, before I start, is my, my uh, speaker, speaker thing is, is, fine, is it fine? No, but okay, go on. Okay. okay. Um, I, I change the speaker. The speaker. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, the, 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 my, my question, question is that if in n equal to four, you said there is no p. Yeah, yeah. So, so then, is, is there no chiral weight in n equal to four? Uh no, no. There is just a SU four R symmetry. I see. Okay. Okay, I mean, actually, I don't know. Uh, let me say I don't know because in, uh, okay, so, okay. Yeah, let me put it this way. Uh, in N is equal to four supergravity, there is a dependent uh, gauge field, which is called as AMU, which is a U1 gauge field. And I think one considers uh, the charge under that U1 gauge field, but it is not, it is, but it is not coming from the algebra. Okay, okay. okay. But, it's a bit technical, so I, I'm not sure that I have it right. I mean, but this part is right, that there is a dependent gauge field, uh, which has this, uh, it, it's a composite gauge field, okay, out, made out of the fundamental uh, fields. But, uh, and and that is used as the U1 symmetry, uh, but uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it's a bit technical because N is equal to four has this spurious uh, symmetry, and because of that, uh, things will become uh, more technical. I see. Okay. 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 Argajati has a comment. Arka, do you want to unmute yourself and just tell us? Hello. Hi. Uh, yeah. So for n equal to four, uh, if you look at the R symmetry generator uh, R R I I I, uh, that will uh, commute with all the generators. If you just look at the algebra, mm -hmm. uh, so what happens that one just uh, mod it out. I mean, you don't need that. I mean, so that you one part drops out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but what what but what happens is that in supergravity there is still a U one gauge field, uh -huh. and I think the people do consider like uh, chiral weights with respect to that gauge field. But but that gauge field the introduction is very indirect, so I am not sure like how that is done. But I am sure there is a composite gauge field. But yeah. yeah. So in these lectures, we will mostly discuss n is equal to 2 and n is equal to 3 supergravity. Because you know, like supergravity is an extremely technical subject, and this is my expertise. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So, so, so there is this uh, 
So go. I just want to make a comment. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Go ahead. Yeah. So this is just about this um, the the R symmetry group for n equals four. Yeah. And uh, I think this really this is just a sort of math question in the sense that you ask. So your n equals four um, uh, multiplet has like a, essentially like an n equals one vector multiplet and three matter multiplets, right? And all of them are in the adjoint. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so. So one way to think about it is that um, the vector is a singlet in S SU4 and the fermions transform in the fundamental representation and the scalars uh, under the uh, in the two times anti-symmetric representation, which is a fundamental of SO6 yeah, and it yeah. is real. So yeah. so the, the fact that uh, the scalars, uh, uh, the representation under which the scalars transform is real is also why you don't have a U1. So that's yeah. just what I, I just wanted to say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Indeed, like as Madhu is saying, it's a mathematics question. But, but what I was trying to say is this concept of chiral weight is still useful in supergravity, which is I think what like Anish was asking. Like, if there is no chiral weight in n is equal to four supergravity, uh, what I know is that uh, we will have a gauge field for this chiral uh, um, symmetry in uh, n is equal to two supergravity, which we will soon discuss. And uh, there is a corresponding field in n is equal to four, but it's a dependent field. So I'm not sure. I think they still use chiral weight with respect to that field. But I have to go back and check and I'll confirm in the next lecture. But Madhu's comment holds for n is equal to four super yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, right. So there is this, so there is also a concept of fail weight. Okay. And uh, of course, commutator of M with Q and M with S, I need not give MAB, the Lorentz transformation, because they're both fermions and they transform the way fermions should transform. Okay, P, the commutator with P is the same form as commutator of K with Q, with Q by Q replaced with S. Okay. S is closest to K, okay. the way P, P, uh, sorry, Q, Q closest to P. And Q is closest to dilatation plus T plus uh, lambda ij uh, plus m. Okay. So I have suppressed all the uh, indices index structure. Okay. But uh, Jacobi identities involving this is what will tell us that there must always be this SUN cross U1 uh, symmetry. So this finishes my discussion of the superconformal algebra. Okay. If uh, if there are questions, I can take them. Otherwise, I will move on. Okay. Hello. Ha, hi. Yeah. So, uh, uh, probably this is not related. Uh, so uh, can you just briefly uh, say um, something? Uh, some superconformal algebra. Uh, for uh -huh. some higher dimension than six, I mean. No, oh, I see, I see. Yeah, maybe I should have mentioned that there are no superconformal algebras, okay, Hi for a dimension higher than six, which satisfy the uh, uh, satisfy the assumptions of the HLS theorem. Okay, but for some brain constructions, there are you know uh, there, there are some loopholes which they utilize, and there is still some sense in which you can define superconformal algebra. But the way we are going to do in these lectures, superconformal algebra exists only up to six times, okay? Uh, provided by NAM. Okay. And these comments you can find in uh, this uh, new book by Friedman, uh, sorry, Van Proen and uh, Lauria, okay, on n is equal to two supergravity. So you can find the relevant references in that book about this question. Okay. Okay. So all these conformal supergravity techniques, they only exist up to six dimensions. Okay. I should have mentioned that. Okay. So now, now that we have all the technical tools, we will study the gauge equivalence between conformal gravity and point current gravity. This is very, uh, this is very much the center of this course. Okay, this 
this uh, is an essential thing to understand to understand why we need uh, why conformal gravity theories are useful to construct Poincare gravity theories and especially when there is supersymmetry but for now we will consider case the case without SUSI okay for simplicity Okay, so our first step will be construct a gauge theory of the superconformal algebra. By that, what I mean is that superconformal algebra has these generators. P A M A B. Uh, sorry. D K A Q I S I lambda T lambda X. Okay. So these are the generators of the uh, uh, superconformal algebra. Okay, so if you so by gauge constructing a gauge theory, what I mean is associate a gauge field to each of these generators. Okay, this is how we do non abelian gauge theory. So this, so later we will see that this field will become the whale bind, okay, uh, and this field will become the uh, this field will become the spin connection, okay. But so, but right now they are independent, okay. They are just gauge fields of this algebra, okay? and uh, this field will become the gravity now, okay, and these will become the these are of course the gauge fields of the uh, U1R and SUNR suite. Okay. So now, what we will question is uh, uh, my oh, sound is better now. Okay. Sorry, I by practice I just considered like you know I just wrote everything, including the supersymmetry ones. <laughs> so let me just. I don't it. It. Sorry. I don't erase it. My question is respect to that. Yeah, yeah, I'm just uh, coloring it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, so these are the supersymmetry ones. Okay, so we will consider uh, these ones now. Yeah. Okay, yeah. tell me. Uh yeah. yeah, so, so my, my question, question is that, uh, so, uh, so in, uh, um, in, in n equal to 1 uh, super gravity, you, you have your uh, usual uh, gear binds, which, which is supposed to uh, be the gravity on degree of freedom, and then you have the gravity on degree of freedom, the gravity on degree of freedom. But now in n extended, you have many of these gravity on degree of So, but you still have this one gravity on. Okay. Uh, uh, I mean, so, so I, I, I don't know any connection in the theory, so, so I'm just curious. So, how, uh, in, in maybe you will address it later, but uh, uh, okay, is, is there like a conceptual thing in many comments that you can make? Like, like are, are they, they just, just I mean, are they like super partners to their evidence or are they like couple to some mean partners to other fields? Are they like this? Okay, so yeah, okay, so okay, so. Uh, so we studied, for example, and, like I stated something about n is equal to two representations here, right? So there is yeah. graviton, gravitino, and also gravitophoton for n is equal to two supergravity. Okay. So now mm -hmm. what will happen is that um, so that is the on-shell supergravity without, uh, I mean, and it's not the matter-coupled supergravity, right? Mm -hmm. So for that, what will happen is that most of these fields will go away in the sense that what we will see in this lecture for without supersymmetry is that omega mu a b will be become dependent on e mu a. Okay. And b mu is used for gauge fixing. Okay. And f mu a is uh, by some constraint, it will become something else, some curvature. Okay. 
So we will left with we'll be left with only Einstein Hilbert action, okay? only a graviton in the Poincare gravity. Okay? So in conformal gravity, conformal gravity, you have more degrees of freedom than Poincare gravity because you have more symmetries, right? But once you gauge fix those symmetries, you get Poincare gravity. Okay. So you have more. So this is a way in which you are trading. Okay. You are increasing the uh, you are increasing the number of uh, uh, degrees of freedom uh, so that you can increase the number of symmetries which will let you do many things because larger symmetry algebras are more powerful but once we do all these gauge fixings we will go to the appropriate number of degrees of freedom for example in super gravity and extended super gravity all these like this will give gravity you know this will become dependent gauge field and these fields uh, will be broken to some uh, gauge field but usually so, like n is equal to two Poincare supergravity need not contain an R symmetry. Okay, so when you go to that, both gauge fields completely gauge fixed. Okay, so they won't appear in the Poincare theory. So in conformal theory, you will have all these fields, but in the Poincare theory, on shell minimal theory, we will have the fields that you mentioned. Okay, but the usefulness is that using this approach, you can also build non minimum like any matter coupling. Which is much harder, like if you just straight away start from one correct Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hello, uh, Sukhu. Yeah. So, uh, can you go back to the previous slide, please? Uh, huh. So, these uh, PA, MAB, and D and K that you have written. Yeah. So, this A is uh, like the tangent space indices, right? And yeah. uh, to go from P A to P mu, we need yeah. these uh, while binds. And similarly for M A B, to go to a, a like the space time, we need this spin connection coefficient. So basically, uh, uh, so basically, this is just the interchange from the tangent indices to the space time indices. Uh, indices right? That's why we uh, use this uh, while binds and uh, spin connection. Uh, yeah, I mean, the way I would say it is that tangent space has this has the symmetry algebra, right? And if you have like any non-abelian uh, symmetry where you have T A as the generators, right? Okay. Then you will write B mu A as the gauge field, okay? where mu is the space time index. That is what we are doing. Okay, so basically these all are like the uh, T A uh, generators of the symmetry algebra. Just e yeah, the ones. These are all oh, generators, okay, and, above, and, yeah, yeah. and the ones below are the gauge fields. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. So associate a gauge field to each generator. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now, one subtlety is that, so we are, so we have mu a, right, and uh, omega may be f mu a. Okay, and B mu. Okay. And we want to construct a theory of gravity, right? So therefore, keeping that in mind, we should notice that what are these the gauge fields of, right? The global symmetry is this. Okay, I mean, okay, it's a bit misleading to write, but okay. So let me just write it vaguely in the tangent space as follows. Okay. But once you once you make xi a going to xi a of x, right? or maybe let me be vague and write it as mu. So this is in anticipation. Okay, more more or less. X mu plus xi mu. These are translations. Okay, but if parameter dependent on the space time, right? This this is like general coordinate translations. Okay, local translations are like general coordinate translations. Okay, now uh, that is interesting because Suppose we have some field, right, which is like a scale, uh, let's say some fermion field or, or let's say scalar field and consider it's delta phi of x. Okay. Then that uh, transformation okay, under uh, 
let's say just the Poincare algebra, okay? uh, uh, that will be P mu uh, P mu sorry. That transformation will be xi mu del mu phi plus lambda ab by 2 l ab or lambda mu nu l mu nu okay. where l mu nu is x mu del nu minus del nu x. Uh, okay, I should write as um, x mu del nu. Okay. So now what you notice here is that if you make xi mu xi mu of x right then you could write as xi mu of x del mu of phi minus lambda mu mu x mu so the whole thing can be written as xi mu of x minus lambda mu mu x mu and this we can call as xi prime mu of x. So what is happening here is that if we have general coordinate transformation, okay, then the space time part of conformal transformations are already part of the general coordinate transformations. Okay, so we can do a basis change. And so this was in the case of point Okay, but in conformal algebra, it might also have you know, the scaling symmetry and so on. Okay. What we are doing is we are doing a basis change so that xi mu of x, okay. So from now on, I'll drop the prime, okay. Contains all the space time part of the transformation. Okay. And Therefore, omega mu a b, f mu a, b mu, okay, what they generate is the internal part of these symmetries, okay. Omega mu a b generates the spin uh, uh, part of the local Lorentz transformation, okay. Similarly, f mu a, similarly, p mu, okay. So, this is how this algebra, this gauge theory is defined. Usually, we don't have general coordinate transformations as a member of the uh, gauge fields, okay, which is why we don't see this feature. Example is compared to conform, uh, conformal field theories where there is no general coordinate transformation. Is that clear? Uh, so, Bo, can you just repeat the last bit again? Uh, I got, I didn't get that. Yeah. Okay, so what, what we are saying is that unlike our usual gauge theories, right? Now we also have local translations, right? Because translation is a member of the algebra, okay? Which is not the case in the, in the usual uh, okay? So because translations is a member of the algebra, once you make the translations local, right? They all contain every information that you can conceive of, right? Because this lambda mu nu x mu can just be absorbed into the definition of psi. Okay. So therefore, the basis that we are in algebra is that all the space time part, okay, like this, uh, uh, like for example, this L mu nu part, which came uh, via this uh, uh, Subhu. x mu. Uh, your voice for the past two minutes is, is actually, it now? yeah, it's just oh. very sporadic. Now is it fine or it's still? No, it, there are huge distortions. Oh, one second, one second. Let me change my Wi-Fi. Oh, I see. Okay. Then what can I do? Maybe, maybe start speaking again.
uh, okay am i audible now yeah sounds better yeah it's basically the same wifi because it seems the other one is not working but let's see how long it goes okay so what was happening here is that we have local translations okay because translation is a member of the algebra which we are trying to construct a gauge theory out of and once you make translations local right they already contain all the global space time transformations that you can define okay and you could make it local of course okay but what we are doing is we are doing a basis change okay? all the space time part of the trans conformal transformations okay so here i was just considering considering a point kare case for simplicity all the local part uh, sorry all the space time part is just absorbed into general local translations okay which later will act as general coordinate transforms okay because usually when people do conformal field theory they do it in flat space right so there the space time part of the conformal transformations make sense okay whereas in in a general coordinate invariant theory right i mean or in a diffeomorphism theory with the uh, diffeomorphism invariance um, i might be using this words wrong actually but <laughs> in a theory with you know general coordinate transformations all these global transformations are just a part of the uh, general coordinate transformations okay therefore uh, what we are considering is let's say we have a fermion okay a fermion transforms with respect to lorentz transformations by orbital angular momentum or spin angular the so orbital angular momentum part of the transformation is absorbed into this sign okay into the action of the p generator okay and the other generators like mab what it is generating is the spin part of the local lorentz transforms is that okay was it audible yeah it was fine okay. are there any questions about this Uh, yeah. So uh, why are you calling this uh, uh, Poincaré supergravity? Because um, it it also has conformal transformations, right? Yeah, yeah. No, actually, what I meant is that uh, the one above is like conformal super uh, gravity. Okay. Okay. And in this example of absorbing the thing into the psi mu. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just I just took a scalar field which transforms under like Poincaré transforms. for simplicity uh, uh, for example okay. it could also have a veil weight then it would have right. this lambda d uh, i don't know not lambda d sorry it it could also have the uh, uh, have the space time transformation under uh, uh, this thing um, dilatation right which would be something right. like x uh, x mu del mu phi that is the Uh, i forget like lambda x mu del mu phi is that the dilatation generator in the space yeah. time conformal transformations yeah so you you can have this also okay and lambda d phi which is the internal transformation under dilatations right this is like the scaling dimension okay right, right. internal scaling dimension but what i am telling is that this part will get absorbed if we go on okay this is the conformal case if we go on with these steps right then in the end what will happen is lambda d phi will still remain outside okay so dilatation is generating the internal part whereas this lambda x mu del mu is absorbed into this sign is that okay it should come sorry sorry i was in mute uh, yeah yeah it is yeah so because we are in a theory of gravity this is how we will do it. okay so now how do we know the transformation rules okay. so the transformation rules are given by usual gauge theory rules fbca okay and uh, the curvatures so these are field trends which we will keep calling as curvatures okay okay 
okay so this is the usual non abelian gauge theory rules okay and we we can give the transformations this way okay for example you could ask specific transformations like what is the transformation of b mu okay under local translation okay then what would happen is of course it is not the gauge field of the translations therefore it won't have del mu epsilon here because this a index here right is for b mu it is just d okay so a runs over i don't know p a k a or a b which is like m a b and d right okay but this structure constant will have d here in place of a okay and the convention is t b t c is f b c a t okay. so what is happening is that i mean what we need is some commutators which close to d okay so this is so because we have chosen the p transformation here this this epsilon has the index a which is actually the p a index okay and this is some b mu b okay and uh, this uh, index is arbitrary and this index is that of p a this index is that of d so what when you take the commutator with p a goes to d okay that is the question that we are asking okay and the answer to that question is that p a k b okay is eta a b d plus m a b okay from the conformal algebra so therefore when you take b mu b as f mu a right which corresponds f mu b which corresponds to which corresponds to the uh, special conformal transformation we get a non trivial transformation okay so all this together will give this result okay so strictly speaking it should be uh, xi a and f mu f mu a but i have just taken the liberty to uh, replace a with nu and nu okay. because we will eventually have an invertible veil bind so we are just using that is this clear so far we have just used the rules of non abelian gauge theory to derive a specific transformation okay and for example del d b mu is del mu lambda d because it is the gauge field of that transformation okay and there are also other transformations for example del m b mu is zero because it contains no tangent space index therefore it does not transform under lorentz transformation so the total transformation written here will be a sum of all these transformations is that okay and another thing is del k b mu which will become important later is lambda k mu okay because you can ask the similar question that we asked for p right so there the there the par parameter will become the parameter for uh, the k transformation okay so the other field okay will will become e mu b okay so we will have commutator between p and k which is which closes to d which is what we need okay and we get this transformation so these are the full transformations of p delta b mu a uh, sorry delta b mu b d this d index is kind of redundant okay but uh, plus lambda and similarly every other field we can write the transformation are there any questions about this okay so uh but now one uh, aspect that is missing is that uh, we have local translations okay but in a theory of gravity this local translation should act as general coordinate transformations and a diagnosis is that the p transformation should act as uh, covariantly derivative uh so which is not happening so far right 
so because so far it is like some internal gauge symmetry which involves uh, some space time generators as well okay so we have not fully reached our goal which is creating a theory of gravity okay for example the spin connection and the whale bind are still independent of each other okay but we want them to be dependent on each other okay so that analysis is done by demanding that the p transformations should go to covariant gcp and one more reason you for see for this is suppose you assume an invertible whale bind okay and there is some scalar field phi and you try to define a covariant derivative for this p okay it will have del mu phi which is what you are trying to make covariant okay but it will also have minus e mu a p a phi which is nothing but minus e mu a del a phi okay because they delay are the generators of translations okay so the disadvantage of this approach is that if you assume an invertible whale bind i mean of course there are other terms right if you assume an invertible whale bind then this covariant derivative okay will begin with zero it won't have any derivative okay which which looks like a use, useless notion of covariant derivative so what we will try to do is we will try to delete pa from the list of gauge transformation okay and we will make it act as a general coordinate transformation externally okay and all the other gauge transformations will be called a standard gauge transformations okay we will see how that is achieved the remedy is delete p and i have covariant general coordinate transformations plus standard gauge transformations okay and notice that if you delete p okay when you uh, consider the conformal algebra okay no no commutator which does not already involve p in the left hand side will p have p on the right hand side okay for example you will have p a m b c going to p eta and so on okay but otherwise you will not have any commutator where the right hand side is p okay to have a commutator which has p on the right hand side it should also be there on the left hand side okay therefore you don't have an inconsistency where like for example if two generators were too close to p then we would be in trouble right how can we delete p when two other generators are closing to p okay so that would have been problematic but that does not happen okay yeah, that is one good thing okay but of course that is not enough okay and we will we will try to see a bit more about it and then we will have a theory of gravity but are there any immediate questions okay so let us consider the metric okay what was the gauge transformation of the metric okay you will find that using the gauge uh, gauge theory rules uh, using structure constants if you Uh, found out the transformation rule you would get this okay which is nothing but so i'll just explain after this point see because uh, because the translation generator has some veil weight right the translation parameter has the opposite weight weight because d comma pa is uh, pa right so pa has weight weight 1 therefore under dilatation xi a changes as goes to minus lambda d xi a 
So in the covariant derivative, we will get B mu psi plus B mu psi. Okay, where we have replaced the transformation parameter by minus the gauge field, like any gauge theory. Okay? And in fact, if you try to do the, uh, try to derive this transformation rule using structure constants, this is the transformation rule that you will get. Okay? Now this can be manipulated, okay, because we know what lead derivatives are. Okay? So this can be manipulated to get LXI in mu. Okay, where L psi is the lead derivative, okay, minus delta psi mu p mu, okay, r p mu. Okay. So this is the lead derivative. Basically, you just add and subtract terms, okay, to this to make it the lead derivative, okay. And this symbol, okay, from now on, what we will do is this A indices corresponds to standard gauge transforms, which are not translation. Okay. What you do is take the gauge field, okay, and see like emu A and see how it transforms under some other transformation. And replace the transformation parameter by minus xi mu b mu a. Okay, then this is the term you get. Okay. And this term also follows if you might if you manipulate this expression. Okay. Now, why is this necessary? This is necessary because I, we, I mean, or why is this natural? Let us say, why is it appearing when we do this manipulation? It is appearing because this lead derivative is not covariant with respect to full conformal algebra. In the sense that, let's say with respect to standard gauge transformation, right? Like suppose you consider lead derivative of, of some field, okay? And that field has some whale weight, it transforms under dilatation, right? Then dilatation gauge field is not a part of the lead derivative, right? But when you take del mu of that field, okay? And then take its dilatation transformation, right? then you will also have a del mu lambda d phi, right? So if you have a scalar field, for example, and if you just defined L xi phi, which is xi mu del mu phi, right? Which is the lead derivative. This won't be covariant with respect to dilatation, okay? Therefore, we take its dilatation transformation, which is let's say lambda d phi with well weight one, Okay, and then replace it by minus xi mu uh, b mu phi. Okay, so then the del mu lambda d that comes from here will get cancelled with del mu lambda d that comes from this b mu. Okay, so whenever you have some other symmetry in gravity, okay, you have to make the gravitational lead derivative covariant with respect to those symmetries. Okay, so therefore, henceforth these two terms together we will call as covariant general coordinate CGC. So the P gauge symmetry is indeed acting as conformal gauge, uh, sorry, covariant gauge transformations, uh, covariant general coordinate transformations, except this additional term, which is xi nu R P mu nu A. Okay. So the remedy for this is that we demand this to be zero. So what we are doing is we had a gauge theory and we said that we will delete one gauge symmetry and we will replace it with something else. Okay. And as a consistency, we need, we need to also impose that RP mu nu A goes to zero. Okay. And indeed this has the right number of components to determine omega mu A B, okay, which is the spin connection. Okay. So if you, if you work it out, okay, this will, imply omega mu a b is a function of e and b okay, just like how you would expect in gravity okay spin connection is a is dependent on the whale bind okay are there any questions i mean this might be like non trivial so and uh, uh, people may not have seen it before so 
please ask as many questions as you like. I mean, to even to repeat something. Arasubu. Uh, ha. Yeah. It, it, I, I was under the impression that this R is sort of the uh, the curvature for the uh, translation generator. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is. Uh, then shouldn't it be just the torsion? Uh. So. Uh. Okay, I mean, this is a theory of without fermions, right? So far, there is no torsion as such. Okay, so right. what 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 will happen is that it it has, uh, uh, I mean, because it is a gauge field corresponding to E mu a, it will have. Uh, okay, let me write in a. Okay, let me write here. I'm sorry for the board work. Okay, but this board is so small. So, it will have del mu E mu a minus del mu E mu a kind of terms. Okay. But because because E also transforms under Lorentz transformation, okay, from the gauge field, it also has omega mu a b e mu b kind of terms, okay. Right. So this looks like the Cartan first structure equation, okay. Which there is also a b here, which is a technicality b e whatever, okay. But this is the Cartan first structure equation, which will determine the spin connection in terms of the wheel bind. Yeah, the torsionless connection, uh, right. tor torsionless condition in uh, gravity. That is what right. we have derived. I see. Okay. Okay. So, provided that is satisfied, okay, then the P transformation on E mu A will act the same way as covariant general coordinate transformations. That is what we have derived. Right. 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 Okay. Are there other questions? Okay, I'll of course summarize it in the next lecture, but uh, feel free to ask me to repeat anything okay, because uh, this is quite important when we consider like conformal supergravity in the next lecture. So, uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, basically, the essence is that we have we have this rigid point current transformations, and yeah. we can uh, like upgrade these. Point current transformations to a general coordinate uh, general coordinate invariance by introducing various gauge fields. Uh, yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, I mean yeah. we have conformal transformations, but yeah, that is true. Yeah, okay, that's what we are doing here, right? Yeah, yeah. This could also be done in Poincaré gravity. Okay, for example, like the way you are saying, take Poincaré uh, uh, algebra, okay, okay, and construct the gauge fields e mu a and omega mu a b. And you have to replace, uh, you have to delete P for the same reason. Okay, then you will get the torsionless constraint. Okay, and this is why in gravity, when we write the covariant derivative, okay, we don't really covariantize with respect to E mu a. Okay, when you take the fluctuations, then you will need to cover. I mean, when you take linearized gravity, then you need to covariantize, which is due to a different reason, which is that this del mu itself. Uh, uh, We'll have this uh, delta mu a e mu a, which is a different uh, uh, reason. Okay. But when you take, when you let's say take a spinner and someone asks you to write the covariant derivative of a spinner, okay, then you don't write a covariant derivative which has both del mu phi and this. Yeah. And this is how you can think about. It. So, uh, so uh, another just a uh, simple question. Uh, so. Uh, they are also from Poincaré gravity, uh, like rigid Poincaré transformation. You can get the general coordinate invariance theory, and yeah. here also we are trying to, uh, from a conformal transformation, we are uh, trying to get the general coordinate invariance theory. Yeah, but right? it, but so but it is also a theory of conformal gravity in the sense that uh, if the gauge symmetry, right, which is satisfied okay. by the other gauge fields, right, okay. that that gauge symmetry is given by the conformal algebra. So, so, I, uh, so I'm not able to understand the difference between these two theories. So one gravity so, theory that you get from Poincaré, the so Einstein this, here, and the one gravity theory that you get from this conformal transformation. Like what's the so this curve? So this curvatures, right? This R mu nu A's. Okay. okay. These R mu nu A's will be conformal invariant instead instead of Poincaré invariant. Ah. Okay. Okay. So what will happen is when you try to construct the action, you are you have with you conformal invariant uh, curvatures okay 
like for example uh, the uh, the m cur the m curvature corresponding to lorentz transformations it has this del mu omega nu ab and other terms okay once we do a few more steps that will be related to the weyl tensor okay instead of the riemann tensor okay. that is what changes okay yeah is that clear Okay, so what we had was we had E mu a, B mu, F mu a, and omega mu a b, but this is now a dependent gauge field. So I I guess I am getting ten extra minutes which Subroni like posted. So uh, so this uh, so omega mu a b. becomes a dependent gauge field because of this condition okay maybe i should change my okay so here ab are anti symmetric indices and mu is an index that runs over four values here mu nu are anti symmetric and a runs over four values but ultimately these have the same number of components so this is enough to determine omega mu a and if you in fact compute this curvature okay this will have many terms but like i told anish it will have omega mu a b okay uh, e mu b okay some term like this but because we have an invertible weyl bind right this gauge field appears algebraically in this curvature so if we set this curvature to zero okay then we can solve for this case and because this curvature is invariant under all the conformal transformations all the standard gauge transformations that we have okay none of the transformations are affected by this okay because it's a covariant way of constraining the gauge field okay. now one could ask in gravity we don't know of any field like this okay f nu a okay so maybe there are more con conditions because ultimately what do we need to want to do we saw that e mu a has in a poincare gravity has six offshell degrees of freedom right whereas we are still left with many more offshell degrees of freedom okay therefore one can look at other curvatures okay and ask do they also have term fields which are algebraic okay and the answer is okay this proportionality constants may be off okay that rm also has a has an a term which has the weyl bind and the gauge field f mu a and weyl bind is invertible so you can make it disappear okay so if you impose rm mu nu ab e mu b is equal to 0 okay this will make f mu a depend okay and this has the same number of components also. now rd also has f mu a as a f mu a e mu a i think which is just f mu nu anti symmetric part okay which is as an algebraic term so you might think we can constrain it more but using the bianchi identities okay for uh, for uh, rp curvature okay if you do d d mu r nu rho okay for p a that is equal to zero that will give you that r d mu nu is also zero okay. so if this condition is satisfied then this curvature is zero okay therefore there are and you we will see that in no other curvature there are additional uh, algebraic fields so what we have is e mu a and b mu are independent fields and f mu a and omega mu a b are dependent fields okay because they can be solved in terms of the other fundamental fields okay 
are there any questions okay okay so what we now have is e mu a and b mu are the independent fields and you know just because the gauge fields became dependent does not mean that the gauge transformations are not there anymore okay because they are still there because uh, because we have not gauge fixed okay we have merely made the gauge field independent okay instead of independent okay therefore e mu a for example has 16 components b mu has 4 so 20 components and conformal algebra has 15 parameters therefore 20 minus 15 is equal to 5 therefore this theory i mean these these fields that we have considered so far they have five optional degrees of freedom is that clear so we have basically taken the number of field components minus the number of gates but to go to poincare gravity we need another uh, degree of freedom because e mu a in poincare gravity has six optional degrees of freedom right poincare e mu a has 10 components sorry 16 components and poincare algebra has 10 parameters so we have six optional degrees of freedom so to get one more optional degree of freedom we introduce a scalar with let's say whale weight 1 in conformal gravity okay so then you have introduced the field with the uh, optional degree of freedom but no extra gauge symmetries therefore you go from five optional degrees of freedom to six optional degrees of freedom so if you have conformal gravity with a scalar field there is hope of getting poincare gravity so in the next lecture we will begin and i think in the first 10 15 minutes we will derive using the um, Uh, using the scalar field action in conformal gravity okay i just give that as an advertise using the scalar field action in conformal gravity we do some gauge fixing where we gauge fix because so far we have not gauge fixed dilatations and special conformal transformations which is Uh, which is not there in poincare gravity by gauge fixing we will get einstein hilbert action in poincare gravity okay and the advantage is that in super gravity considering a matter field action is much easier okay in conformal gravity than constructing the poincare super gravity action in poincare super gravity okay therefore this is an extremely useful method okay so most conformal uh, most poincare super gravity theories are constructed this way they are constructed as broken uh, uh, super conformal super gravity theories okay which is also so so yeah so okay yeah yeah i have a quick question yeah uh, so uh, the scalar field that you have introduced is that uh, conformally coupled or is it minimally coupled Conformally coupled or minimally coupled? Ah, uh, 
uh, what do you mean by conformally coupled uh, in the sense like phi times r or something of that sort uh, no it is in conformal gravity it is minimally coupled okay I see. so what will happen is that you will see that uh, once you uh, substitute dependent gauge fields in, in in terms of independent gauge field mm -hmm. it will look like conformally coupled oh oh i see yeah, and then so basically what you need to do is once you gauge fix the special conformal transformations okay right and and you um, uh, by uh, you can basically set b mu to zero because it goes to lambda k mu, and okay. uh, and then if you express f mu in terms of the its expression, which which you can solve for by the constraints given earlier, okay, okay. then you will see that it is a uh, uh, it is like uh, it is related to the conformally coupled. I see. I see. Uh, if I remember correctly, conformally coupled scalar to uh, usual Einstein-Hilbert uh, gravity is nothing but f of r gravity, right? Oh, I see. No, I mean, okay, maybe I'm using some. I'm saying something different. Okay, wait. Uh, one second. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What you will get is uh, so r phi square. Yeah. So what will happen is when if you have like the r in Poincaré gravity right. and couple it to some scalar field by r phi square, and okay. if you add a scalar field action with the wrong sign, okay, in, oh, a okay. in a specific with a specific coefficient, okay. then it will it, then the theory is actually a conformal gravity theory. So I see it. It also has scaling symmetry. So we will do that next time. Okay. Okay. Okay, with the with arbitrary coefficient and with the right sign for the scalar kinetic term, I think it will be some uh -huh. other other theory. Okay, okay, okay. I see, I see. Yeah. Basically, the scalar field is just to use to gauge fix. That's why it has the wrong sign. Okay, okay. Uh, so, I have yeah. Probably very nice sort of question. So, uh, so you are adding uh, one scalar field, or uh, I mean, uh, one extra degrees of freedom to compensate one extra degrees of freedom. You are adding that uh, scalar yeah. field, right? Yeah. Now, uh, so once you add that, now the statement that you wrote now, the uh, statement in the screen, that yeah. now that equivalence is now in optional as well, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Option. So, yeah. is it possible, or is it possible? Let's say I, I add uh, two scalar uh, scalar field. So, uh, yeah. So the optional degree of freedom will not match, or or even I don't add any scalar field. The optional no, like, does not no. match, but on shell will it match or something I'm missing? Yeah, no. So okay, so basically optional degrees of freedom uh, uh, matching will help us get the Einstein Hilbert action. Okay, because it's not the matching between bosons and fermions that I discussed earlier, right? Right. It is just that it is just that we are trying to see how to construct a construct the uh, how to have an another offshell representation for the Poincaré gravity fields okay? and by adding more gauge fields we can make it make that a conformal gravity representation okay? but but uh, but if you have one more scalar field you will just get Einstein Hilbert action coupled to that scalar field so this is how you get okay. matter coupled Poincaré supergravity theories because in conformal supergravity, there won't be just one scalar field. It will be a whole multiplet. And only some of them will be gauge fixed. Okay, The others will remain as fields in the Poincaré supergravity theory. Does that okay? So, uh, ha, ha, yeah. Uh, yeah. I had a question uh, in the previous slide. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the last line uh, you made some comment about uh, we can also uh, if we can also restrict not this slide the next one where you have written this Bianchi identity uh, yeah 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 or the curvature yeah 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 so we, uh, we could re restrict more if we use this R D but we can't because we have this Bianchi identity for translation yeah. curvature uh, which yeah. uh, lead uh, us to this dilatation curvature going to zero yeah if the R M con constraint is imposed. Okay, uh, so the so my doubt is, uh, is it uh, like the blanket identity would change if we have a metamultiplet coupled, right? Yeah, so the details might change, 
but the point yeah. is that once rm is fixed rd is also mm -hmm. fixed by this bianchi identity you might have some extra term in supergravity okay mm -hmm. but this fact that you can't use rd to constrain it further won't change like the rm constraint will completely determine the value of rd it is zero here and it will have some fermions in like supergravity but that won't matter okay okay yeah sure yeah okay okay so i think uh, we are already 16 minutes past 12:30 so let us thank subhu for his lectures so let me pause the recording first and uh, then if people have more informal questions uh, people can ask but before that we will have an announcement to make so please stick around okay welcome back to the post lunch session of day 3 uh, we will have vishwajit telling us about soft theorems now so vishwajit over to you thank you so in this lecture first i will recap what we have done in the last lecture first of all, so basically what what we have done in the last lecture is basically we started with the multiple soft photon and the soft graviton theorem then we have uh, defined the classical limit and taking classical limit from this multiple soft theorem what we have gotten is that we can relate this soft theorem to electromagnetic and gravitational wave form at least uh, when the gravitational electromagnetic wave form are uh, long wavelength of the uh, wavelength which is large compared to the uh, characteristics characteristic scale of the scattering process which could be the impact parameter or could be the schwarzschild radius of the particles which are scattering so the precise expression what we have gotten say for uh, electromagnetism for that what we have and done is that first uh, so suppose uh, there is some particles are scattering and we know the asymptotic trajectories of the particle so for that we can determine that what will be the current density for their asymptotic trajectories and then suppose we solve the maxwell's equation in terms of the current density for the asymptotic uh, trajectories of the particles and take the large radius limit then what we find is that if we want to observe the large radius limit what will be the waveform for electromagnetic field what we found is that this waveform is like written here that it can be determined if we know the fourier transform of the current density up to some normalization the normalization is written here and here this a tilde mu corresponds to just the time variable fourier transform of the gauge field and this j hat mu k which is basically the full fourier transform in the all the four variable of the current density and this n you see contains some omega dependence and also it has some 1 over r power and you can see the 1 over r power is goes like 1 over r to the power d minus 2 by 2 which you know in d dimension is basically the radiative fall off consistent with the finite energy condition uh, if you integrate out the energy over the celestial sphere. Um, Vishwajit, uh, maybe yes. I miss, missed something like, uh, uh, so on the LHS you have variables omega and x. Right. On the RHS uh, variables, uh, oh I see, I see, okay, okay. 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 So, so this below, k is, yeah. oh I see, I see, yeah, okay, okay. I got so it. So in the okay. saddle point approximation, what happens is that this k basically turns out to be along the direction of okay, the okay. gauge yeah. field. Okay, so, okay, yeah. And R is the distance from the scattering center to the detector. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. okay. So then, uh, so this is just a solution of uh, large distance or the radiative solutions of the Maxwell's equation. Now, what we have done, we basically have compared the energy flux computed from the classical limit of the soft photon theorem and the independent computation of the classical electromagnetic radiation energy flux. And then we basically compared these two energy flux and up to some overall phase factor, we have related the radiative mode of the gauge field to the electromagnetic soft, like the soft photon factor. And just remember, this is a single soft photon factor. Is there any question? Yeah. Uh, so why did we not have to construct any coherent state or something? Okay, like... Uh, That's mm -hmm. what we usually think about it. Okay. 
construct the corresponding Fourier space, maybe just of soft moment of uh, right, right, right. Space. But then I would have thought you would have to invoke uh, soft theorem of the arbitrary number of soft. Right, right. So I think uh, like, uh, so what here we are doing is that we are considering large number of photon are coming out, then we can think of this large number of photon is basically a particular same energy and polarization. And then we are considering those to be as a coherent state of photon, which produces the electromagnetic but, wave. But we, have to, we have to have uh, add uh, soft uh, external particle amplitude to specific gates and so on. Okay. If we do it that way, so Okay, okay, but here we are trying to do from the S matrix. So if you like, okay, so then let me tell what to do the prescription if you try to do like there you can think of that. Okay, suppose you have some in state, which is suppose two particle state P1, P2. Then you have a coherent state of um, uh, coherence, like due to long range interaction, you will have some kind of coherent state. So let me write down the coherent state, some operator C. And then you will have a C dagger and then some finite particle momentum as suppose P3 and P4. Then what you do is that you compute the expectation value of this a tilde mu omega comma x vector, and that will give you basically your classical. This is what coherent state picture tells us, right? Omega comma x vector. That is how you should compute. And this C coherent state operator, you can think this is basically this turns out to be in a sense some exponential of 34 k upon 2 pi whole to the power 4 some delta of k square plus m square theta of k0 and then some creation annihilation operator like mu of k minus mu dagger of k right with some sorry and some multiplication of epsilon mu other particle finite energy particles number density and their polarization upon some P dot K at the number density is the finite energy particles uh, number operator. Okay, this turns out to be basically the coherent state operator and you have to insert this coherent state operator and then you consider that this is this thing is basically the coherent state for the incoming object. This is the coherent state of the outgoing object and then compute the expectation value of the gauge field. And up, like if you do this thing up to leading order the soft theorem what uh, I have shown for the uh, Electromagnetism case, you can recover that. That will be the leading soft factor. So, so yes, uh, I don't have to necessarily like sum over many soft photon diagrams to construct some. Uh, yeah, yeah. At least, coherent, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Field configuration. Right? You're saying I just have to consider coherent state of the sourcing particles. Yeah, yeah. So sourcing particles and also the C operator contains the photon information, right? There is some photo AMUs are basically the photon annihilation creation operators. And this is the coherent state asymptotically what you have. And then you compute the expectation value of the gauge field at some particular o energy yeah, and is, omega. This is, just a, this is just a one point function calculation for AMU in some right, right. sourcing particles. This is not a S matrix computation in a sense. This is like if you have a state, coherent state from there, how you can extract the classical result. But so what we are doing of, is, yes, hello. This is background of some uh, parts, some sourcing particle, and then you're calculating expectation of the Right, and the sourcing particles are the scattered objects, you can yeah. think. Yeah, right. I, 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 I guess I understand, I can, uh, maybe I can get the uh, Coulomb background or something like this, but I'm slightly confused uh, because I would have thought classical uh, configurations like which we are matching to right now. Yeah, I means in the gauge field, like what I know is that the coherent state, like the gauge field, then you have to also give, like, since this is a scattering experiment, we are thinking, so you have to give the source of this gauge field to, to form the coherent state, in a sense. And like this could be one way of computing and from there actually one have people have shown that leading soft factor one can get as a MU. But what I am telling is that like, from the S, if you know the S matrix, suppose you don't have any coherent state picture. In the S matrix, you have some large number of photons are coming out. You take some like macroscopic charge objects are scattering, and from there, you know you know that suppose multiple number of soft photons are coming in, uh, coming out, and then you see that okay, how many numbers of them are coming in, uh, coming out? Uh, is there in distribution? And you see that the distribution is peaked around certain value. And then basically that, so you basically think that those much number of photons with that energy and polarization are coming out and you are, if this is large, I can 
pick, consider this as a coherent state of photon and declare it as a gauge field. This is the physical picture, I can say. So, so, sorry, I, maybe I missed this, but did we go through this calculation where you figure out where is the, what, and what number, what number of photons peak and so on? Yes, 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 we have computed. So we have oh, shown a distribution okay. where basically it is peaked around a value, which is basically determined by the leading, like the soft factor. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah, so that computation we have done yesterday. So then the relation what we found is uh, the relation is written here that if you contact with the polarized tensor to the waveform of the electromagnetic waveform, that should turn out to be proportional to the single soft factor in the classical limit. Like it is, I have shown up to only the leading order, but it is true up to the sub leading order. Also, one can verify by visit calculation both sides and can match. So then we have done the same thing uh, for the gravity case. We started with say multiple soft graviton theorem in higher D because D equal to four, we know there is problem. So the result, whatever we have in higher dimensions, we have done the similar analysis, take first classical limit, then soft limit. And then sim by similar analysis, one can show that uh, this gauge field, E tilde mu nu, which is basically the trace uh, reverse gauge, gauge field, which is what I have defined S mu nu, if you just take S mu nu minus uh, half of eta mu nu S rho S rho, the trace reverse field. Then, and if you just contact with the, uh, its polarization tensor, what you will find that that is proportional to the leading and the subleading soft factor, but the subleading soft factor is a classical subleading soft factor, not the quantum one where you have a angular momentum operator, but here you have a classical angular momentum in place of that. And the classical angular momentum is determined by the trajectories of the particle. This is basically R cross P in, if it is a three vector, but this is uh, a tensor. So this is the expression written here. And we have seen that like, uh, if we try to analyze in higher D, uh, we uh, assume the asymptotic trajectory of the particle. So this factor basically turns out to be, depends on the impact parameter and the time delay uh, of the particles relative to each other. And the subleading soft factor is as usual. This since this is a multiplicative factor, it remains as usual. So the fact is that even though we have started from multiple soft graviton theorem, finally in the classical limit, uh, we have able to relate uh, this electron gravitational waveform to only the single soft graviton factor. All the complications were there in the multiple soft graviton theorem. It was basically goes down in the classical and the soft limit. So this is what we want to uh, keep in mind, and then. We want to see that, okay, like so much uh, we have done in higher dimension, but our world is four space time dimension. Can we make sense of uh, four space time dimension some soft theorem? So obviously uh, in four space time dimension, as you know, also I will uh, briefly tell uh, also that uh, the S matrix turns out to be IR divergent in a sense when some massless particles runs in loop, it turns out that the S matrix is IR divergent. So, and since uh, S like since soft theorem is a property of the S matrix, so it is not clear of that how to deal or how to analyze the soft theorem. So let's first, okay, even if from the S matrix thing, we don't know, but probably we believe that uh, this classical derivation could go even in four dimension. And if you naively assume that say, okay, classical limit of soft theorem is still valid in D equal to four, how much we can progress? Can we have at least the classical part of the soft graviton theorem even in four space time dimension? So this is the question we uh, asked yesterday and I will give some answer to this question today depending on some naive assumptions. This is one of the naive assumptions that even the higher dimensional soft theorem is true in four space time dimension. And also uh, later on I will give also some assumptions, but uh, one can uh, like, uh, they have some physical understanding, but those are not rigorous. The, for the rigorous proof, uh, I will give uh, in the last lecture, I will prove it rigorously, the classical soft theorem. But now some naive understanding, and, um, assumptions and some physical understanding, how much I can get the information about the soft factor in four space time dimension that I will do in the classical limit. Then I will try to derive the same soft factor or maybe some extra quantum corrections from the S matrix analysis. So this is the goal of today's lecture. And let's see so how much we can proceed. Yes. Yes. Yeah, uh, so uh, since uh, Chubhani was asking, so I can make a comment that I was trying to make earlier, uh, okay. yesterday. So can you go back uh, to this uh, geodesic equation, uh, the slide where you wrote down uh, that particle trajectory in 
higher dimension in higher dimension yeah so yeah, yeah this will do uh, so i mean uh, this no, is this not is very much related. this is four dimension right this okay. is not very much uh, related to what you are discussing now but uh, i mean that's why i wanted to like uh, no i will discuss this thing now also okay. uh, later uh, mm -hmm. but, but uh, i mean uh, this discussion is very much uh, related to what we are discussing earlier about the fall of conditions we see that uh, this uh, uh, geodesic equation uh, mm -hmm. we obtain it from uh, what uh, the newton's uh, law right? right i right. mean we know we have a coulombic potential which falls off as 1 over r right and also like from our gr course we know uh, that uh, let, let's say a particle moving in the background of schwarzschild matrix and then the metric perturbation h00 is actually related to this uh, Newtonian potential. I mean, there is a way of right, right, taking right. the non-nativistic limit. So, I mean, uh, the thing that I wanted to say is that, I mean, arbitrarily changing the fall of conditions on the matrix can lead to change of other physical laws. For example, so H00 in the mm -hmm. case of uh, this uh, Bondi matrix will be related to HUU. So now HUU, if it has a different fall off, so that right, may right. lead to change of uh, this Newton's law. I mean, modification to the law, which is not very much expected. I mean, so there are indeed some principles which set what boundary condition from physical point of view uh, mm -hmm. we can look at. So, for example, yeah. in higher dimensions, HEU cannot have mm -hmm. a like a one over, uh, say in six dimension, HEU always falls off as one by R cube uh, if it has to, sorry, one by R square if it has to be consistent with uh, Newton's law. I mean, yeah, I, I think yeah, one over R to the power D minus three ah, so, potential. Right, so one by yeah. R cube. So now, like, uh, I mean, from the asymptotic flatness point of view, there may be other boundary conditions available. Mm -hmm. But uh, if we want, uh, let's say, Newton's law to be valid. Mm -hmm. So I guess that uh, it also sets a principle what boundary conditions can be allowed. Okay, but I think we have to be a bit careful here because I think if we do some gauge transformation uh -huh. at the boundary, right, mm -hmm. then like it, it will not affect the local physics. The metric might look different, but locally yeah, it will but be the same. It is only changing something global. No, no, so, yeah, if it, so if it change maybe some coefficient of r to the power d minus 3 maybe it's still fine but it cannot give 1 over r to the power d minus 2 after gauge transformation yeah it's yeah. more leading than that that we have to be make sure yes yeah, exactly right so the exactly i mean the, so i mean these are asymptotic equations of motion right so right. i mean it also depends on the boundary conditions in that way yeah yeah Okay. So today, uh, what we try to do, so let me again repeat this analysis a little bit that uh, how the trajectory will look like if we just solve non-relativistic, uh, non-relativistic even Newtonian, uh, non-relativistic Newton's, like Newton's equation even in potential, which is electromagnetic or uh, uh, gravitational, which goes like in D equal to 4, 1 by R. So suppose this trajectory equation is d square r dt square equal to minus dv dr and this goes like some constant upon r square in electromagnetism or in gravity. Now suppose you want to solve this equation you see that obviously if the force at like if suppose you start with a trajectory which is like asymptotically it's like moving at constant uh, velocity so some b T and then like you want to find that what would be the correction next order correction in higher dimension you can see that next order correction turns out to be one over t and other things so at t going to infinity those will be uh, irrelevant and like the trajectory will be fine but you want to see that what happens uh, in four space time dimension so suppose there is some correction and we don't know the correction yet so just substitute this r in the right hand side and up take large t limit and try to analyze how large t the trajectory could look like. So, sorry, this square r. dt square and this goes like some constant by v square into 1 upon t square at t going to infinity. Okay. Then you can see that the consistent solution to this could be that R will be some R0 plus constant T 
minus c upon v square times log t right so you see if you take the say you usually define the velocity at time t to be dr dt and you see this is like constant velocity v minus some c by v square upon 1 by t so at large t like you can see that okay it still can be defined by like constant velocity but there is a 1 over t piece which tells us there is a non trivial acceleration term right even at large distance so probably this long range effect we have to take care of more carefully in the four space time dimension and we can see what will be its consequence in the subleading soft graviton factor where some angular momentum is associated so at least one thing i want to see is that the trajectory at time t has a with the constant velocity like r0 plus vt there is a log t piece in the trajectory and in a more coherent way we can write down this expression say eighth particle so there are some particles are scattering say i am considering the eighth particle and the eighth particle's trajectory is some um, so let me give you some r0 in here Log sigma. The CMU is still undetermined, but we can determine it solving uh, the max solving the uh, Newton's or uh, equation of motion of the eighth particle in electromagnetic force or under gravitational force. But for a moment, just suppose if you consider this is the trajectory of the particle, and you see that what will be the expression for the classical angular momentum of this due to this particle's asymptotic trajectory, how it will look like. So then you see that the classical angular momentum has the expression. So a nu minus a mu, which has sigma. Now you see that at large sigma, this is the term which dominates over the first term. And you see that the angular classical angular momentum diverges when you go to large distance. And now if you just substitute this expression in the subleading soft classical subleading soft factor, say, for a gravitational case, so I'm just considering the particles as spinless for a moment. So for Spinless particle scattering. So it turns out that some some over all the particles which are involved in the scattering. So I factor due to the classical angular momentum, and then you have C A mm, zero. log sigma, right? So it turns out that this even the subleading soft graviton factor also diverges if you take sigma going to infinity. But what we have shown is that the electromagnetic waveform, if you contact with the epsilon mu nu, that is proportional to the leading plus subleading soft factor. Right? But we know that in a scattering process like black hole merger or any other scattering process, we can observe the uh, gravitational waveform and the gravitational waveform is finite. So something is going wrong in this analysis and we want to find out what uh, is going wrong. 
so the possibility one of the possibility is that possibly the thing what happens is that we assume that to derive the soft theorem that we always take the like the expansion in the soft energy to be a power series expansion maybe this is not always true there may not ex um, we should not expect that there would be always a power series expansion or taylor series expansion and maybe the other thing uh, is that there is a cut off associated in this scale like since you see the soft graviton factor depends on the energy like omega and uh, the polarization of the particles and other things so what do you expect is that maybe the sigma is really there is a cut off energy cut off after which this relation uh, is not probably valid in a sense you can think that maybe what is happening is that if some scattering is happening here maybe if you want to observe uh, observe a electro gravitational wave form with frequency omega that may take care of only the information of the scattering process up to a uh, distance of order omega inverse after that what is the trajectory of the particle is that would not affect me uh, to the gravitational wave form of energy omega this is a reasonable assumption physical assumption because like if you really try to observe a frequent uh, gravitational radiation of energy omega or wavelength omega inverse then you should not expect that beyond omega like from the scattering beyond omega inverse uh, distance but the scattering what is happening that information should not contained by the uh, frequency you know, omega gravitational radiation i have a naive question yes uh, so if you just go back to the expression of uh, angular momentum right right in the first line these r's are there right right aren't they functions of sigma as well yeah they are functions of sigma and because as sigma mm -hmm. Oh, I, oh! These are R naughts, is it? Oh, the, here, yeah. The, here it is the R naught. This is oh, so the these are not functions of sigma. Yeah, no, yeah. these are not the functions no. of sigma. Thank you. Okay. So the naive guess is that possibly there is a cut off for sigma, which is omega inverse. If we are looking uh, at the gravitational radiation of energy omega, and only we can trust this uh, soft expansion up to that point. and the other mathematical thing is that like uh, there is this log sigma in the trajectory and if you try to do a kind of fourier transform then you expect that this should have a, like if, if you take this sigma to be large then you should like and so there is a uh, d sigma integration and you are only analyzing a sigma to be large distance so then you can think of that this contribute some Means this like after if sigma is large and okay uh, so they I'm doing correct or yeah, I, okay maybe maybe what I want to tell is that like uh, maybe after uh, the frequency like if you are particular fixed frequency if you want to observe and you are uh, looking at the trajectory sigma which is large compared to the omega inverse proper time uh, trajectory that you would expect that that should not uh, affect the soft radiation of uh, frequency omega. so this is just we are hoping that probably this could work and then with this cut off we can write down what would be the form of the soft theorem and then we can test like in a classical scattering process we directly compute uh, gravitational radiation and make a omega expansion and we can check that our assumption is valid or not so this is one of the uh, naive physical understanding and with this understanding if we believe that this is correct then just what we have to do is that maybe this log sigma we can replace by log omega inverse and that could be our subleading soft factor and in that case you see there is one omega in the numerator in inside k the other omega in the denominator inside k so omega omega p cancels and subleading order it turns out to be log of omega earlier what happens is the subleading order was omega to the power 0 but this log omega in omega when omega is small is uh, like much more dominant than omega to the power 0 piece so you should expect the more dominant piece in the subleading soft factor probably is log of omega and this also justifies that uh, that if, uh, why we are facing this divergent problem because we are trying to expand this log omega in a power series of omega about omega equal to 0 which simply does not exist so is there any question up to this point
so then uh, like we are expecting that okay so then this could be the soft factor which still we have not derived but some physical understanding and some nine assumption we got and we can test for certain results but before even that it, this does not give the full uh, sub leading soft factor because you know this ca factors are still undetermined and we have to determine them right okay so let's do that how one can determine this cmu so you take the trajectory of the particle rmu sigma to be r0 a mu plus sigma plus some cmu log mod sigma and then like for first for the leading trajectory of the particle say all some particles are scattering and there are many other particles and say for particle b at leading order it has trajectory sigma plus some other sub leading corrections and at leading order this is the trajectory and for that let us compute what will be the gravity so what will be the strategy is that to find the cmu cmu we feel that this is due to the long range interaction because the particle is not moving now in a flat space time but in a uh, in a curved space time and the curvature is produced by the other particles long range force so we can try to find that okay so that means we have to basically solve uh, the trajectory equation which is the geodesic equation for the eighth particle due to the background produced by the other particles motion so that is what uh, will determine the coefficient cmu so for that at first step what you have to do is that suppose some particle with motion say so straight line motion try to find out what will be the metric correction this is the in like the trace reverse metric uh, fluctuation and that you can uh, just by uh, solving the like okay let me maybe go one step so for this particle straight line motion you can write down what will be the energy momentum tensor is for particle b t mu nu how it will look like will be some d sigma delta over of x minus Add a sigma. If you want to find that x value, and then d. So the sigma. Right, and for that, up to leading order, you can solve. the linearized einstein's equation for particle b the metric you use the for particle b uh, the energy momentum tensor and then uh, solve it i am using the convention 8 pi g equal to 1 okay so you have to use the retarded propagator to solve it and in coordinate space the retarded propagator which we have written yesterday the momentum space one turns out to be minus 1 upon 2 pi delta x minus x times square so or, or let me put dy square d to the power 4y delta of square and then there is a theta function also which tells us the retardedness and then uh, you have uh, y so minus 1 upon 2 pi times this uh, this factor with minus sign and this is the basically the uh, uh, retarded propagator which we have written in yesterday you can see that this is also like one can obviously derive from the momentum space one Uh, by integrating out the momentum variable or you can like physically understand why this will be because like massless particles are basically is a graviton which is uh, or basically you can like massless particles are moving in a on the light cone so obviously the green's function should be supported on the light cone so that is why this delta function x minus y square is there and the other thing is that since it is a retarded one so there is a theta function which is telling that x0 
and greater than y0 it will contribute if it is x0 is less than y0 then it will not contribute like if the source is in the past light cone of the particle only it should contribute okay so then you can find out what would be the leading order a metric for the trajectory of the bit particle and if you just solve it what you will get is so i think it's 4 5 Now, once you have the leading order metric for the particle B, you compute what will be the first wall connection. And then all the particle B, like if, you, if the particle A is say outgoing, then all the particle B which are outgoing and B not equal to A for those whatever the metric you have for that you compute the crystal connection with this crystal connection you solve the geodesic equation for the eighth particle in a sense you solve say a is outgoing then the sigma square you have to solve minus summation over all the particle b and b is outgoing also and b not equal to a So up to leading order, I can just write zero. And one thing you see that how it will, how the gamma will look like, you see that if you substitute here, like if you, gamma is basically, you have to take a derivative over the matrix. Gamma is single derivative over the matrix fluctuation. So already it has one over mod x kind of power. If you take another derivative, it will become one over mod x square at large x. So the gamma, and if you substitute the trajectory, it goes like one over sigma square at large x. Or at large sigma, right? And then you see that the trajectory coefficient, you have a CMU log sigma. Then if you take twice derivative, that also goes like one over sigma square. So that will tell us that this side is also one over sigma square. This is also one over sigma square. Comparing one over sigma square coefficient, you can find out what will be the CMU is, which is the coefficient of the log sigma in the trajectory equation. And then you substitute in the soft factor, and you can find what will be the subleading soft factor would be. But is it enough? So that question we can ask, and probably this is not enough because really what the soft graviton is going out that can also feel wrong range interaction due to the other particles that we have not taken care yet. Right, so possibly we have to take care of Take care of long range interaction over the trajectory of soft graviton itself. The corresponding gravity wave basically. So one can show that also the soft graviton feels a long range interaction due to the uh, background produced by the other particles motion. And one can find that there also turns out if you see the soft graviton trajectory. This is obviously null vector, soft graviton velocity is null. And then you can you have to find out what will be the coefficient of this block tau. So this also contains a trajectory component which is uh, which uh, has, keeps track of the long range interaction. So you can solve the then the trajectory equation for the graviton itself for the massless particle in the background of the uh, metric produced by all the other finite energy particles motion. And you can compute what would be this mu is. 
uh, Bichudu? Yes. So this trajectory is only valid asymptotically, right? For large tau. Right, right. This or, trajectory is valid. Yeah, yeah, only asymptotically. Okay. So at last. And the E mu knew that uh, you showed in the last slide. So those are like a metric perturbations on the top of your um, Minkowski space or something. Can right, 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 right. Yeah, so this is the leading order metric perturbation. Like if you consider the particles are moving asymptotically in straight line, you will find this leading order metric perturbation and then use this perturbation to derive the correction to the trajectory of the particle and also correction to the trajectory of the graviton itself. Yes. So right now, maybe I missed it. Uh, right, right now, are we in um, uh, uh, perturbative uh, gravity uh, or uh, uh, are we in the one pi kind of Oh, now we are in perturbative gravity. This is completely classical calculation I am doing, and I am ah. studying only classical soft graviton theorem. Okay. 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 okay, okay. I, see. I see. So, so, so then, um, uh, if, um, if, if, if it is in uh, perturbative gravity, uh, then, then uh, this, this is without any variation effect of the soft gravity. Oh, actually, uh, some of uh, your voice is doubling. I cannot. Uh, okay. Can you speak once again? Now? Yeah, now it's a little better. Uh, yeah, I yeah, changed it to same as this term. Uh, but it is still in. Uh, now? now? Yeah, yeah, you can ask the question. I can try to. Uh, yeah. yeah, so, so, so the, the question, question that I had was that um, uh, if uh, this soft gravitator does not have any back reaction. Yeah, it can have a back reaction. So this back reaction would have to take care of in the propagator. In a sense, like you see, to get the correct corrected trajectory first to when you computed the metric fluctuation. So we have used only in a sense flat space propagator, right? Delta X minus X prime square. Exactly, exactly right. right right so uh, to, to understand the back reaction of this uh, graviton one have to correct the propagator also properly so we are not here computing the back reaction part i mean like it's hard to compute the way I, which i am doing i'll do this thing in the last lecture but uh, at least the time delay part like you should affect that the, even if this is a like soft graviton this will feel a long range force and this long range force can affect the time delay like if you like if it is if the graviton which is a massless particle moves in a straight line without any time delay then up to distance to the distance uh, to reach the distance r of the detector you need a time of order r right since c equal to 1 right right, right. But uh, like what I will show is that if you take care of this long range uh, force on the graviton itself, there will be time delay effect and that you can compute in this way, even uh, using this flat space Green's function. I see, I see. I see. But, okay. the back, yeah, but the backscattering part, I cannot compute in this analysis. So I'll assume basically some uh, due to some completeness or some other calculations which people have done, Peter's calculation, one can compare and one can add up to this time delay part and it has the exact coefficient with, with the time delay so you can add up and can write down what will be the full soft factor but i will prove this uh, classical analysis in more in, uh, detail in the last lecture also taking how to derive the um, uh, back um, uh, backscattering part okay okay, okay. 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 So what happens is that if you uh, then basically again try to solve the geodesy equation for the graviton itself due to the uh, card metric produced by the other scattered object, what you will find is that this mu will look like all the beat particle when B is outgoing. B alpha. This is what you will find. And then what you can say that, okay, then I want that, like what you expect is that what will be the like phase factor which will multiply in usual. Like if we think that the plane wave basis, like suppose the graviton is in plane wave basis, then I will expect that in the plane wave basis expansion, I can expand it in terms of it to the power i k dot x. But you see that possibly we cannot do here because now since the motion of the particle contains a locked out piece, so that uh, locked up is correction we have to take care of properly and that can correct the plane wave basis uh, which we naively assume to start with. 
so in a sense what i am telling is that if you demand that x0 tau is equal to t and at large tau let me call this uh, i just throw this piece constant piece and in large tau this is n0 is like n mu is an null vector so this is one comma some in it in it is that along direction uh, of the uh, detector from the scattering center so then this is tau plus some m0 times log tau and you just can reverse it and up to uh, linear up to the order of uh, tau you can find that this tau if you just replace t minus m not log t will be the plus dot 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 some correction and then if you just substitute this in the phase what you will find is that the plane wave basis expansion breaks down because of this log t piece and what you will see is that if you try to compute what will be this i k dot x tau that will have a factor which is this is the usual plane wave basis expansion and times log t piece so this phase factor will be multiplied to this thing okay i think uh, i missed something Yeah, I think also there is a PB dot K factor M. Acha, this M zero has already the PB information of the P momentum, right? Fine. So then, if you have this K mu to be along basically minus omega comma one comma in head, then what you can see that this factor reduces to multiplication of a factor minus I upon four pi log t. Summation over B belongs to out P B dot K. So now, if you are like so, the, what this is telling? This is telling that with the e to the power i omega t, you will have an extra correction which is proportional to log t. And if you combine this part to this thing, it is telling us that there will be time delay. And if you are putting your detector at distance r, so if you put t equal to r, you will see that there will be time delay, and the time delay. Uh, to reach the gravitational wave is not the usual time which you will expect r but with this extra factor you will have a sorry plus log r piece and then out pb dot k so to reach the detector the gravitational wave due to long range force of the other particle uh, it will not reach at t equal to r but it will reach at some t prime which is uh, some extra correction due to the long range force of the other particles associated with it and since the graviton or the gravity wave in the external state only so only the outgoing particles will affect the long range uh, affects the long range force to it so it means that you have to multiply by a phase factor to the soft graviton factor whatever you have so if you uh, have the soft graviton factor s you have to multiply this thing by this extra phase piece pb dot k term because now this this basically tells you the time delay piece now what one suggests that if one compute like if one computes this electromagnetic the gravitational wave form from independent calculation one find that one can find this phase factor but with this what one find that you see there is a log r piece so one find that this is not just log r but with this one will have also a log omega piece or omega inverse uh, r is a distance omega is a frequency frequency one by time i think but i is fine yeah this is fine also okay this is fine okay so i will find that basically one have to add not only log r piece but this is just from some independent calculation one can find there will be also log omega correction 
so like this so assuming that there is some kind of log omega correction which will make this log r to be log r log omega r to be dimensionless the full soft factor now contains not only the log omega piece due to the long range force between the finite energy particles but also have a phase factor which is also goes like log omega and that basically takes care of the fact that the backscattering effect though we have not derived it but some independent derivation one can verify along with the time delay part and wh what one find is that the full uh, sub uh, subleading soft graviton factor turns out to be this phase factor multiplied to the leading soft graviton factor this is Plus in the subleading soft factor, you just uh, substitute the now the angular momentum or classical angular momentum of the particle, replacing log sigma by log omega inverse. And now also we have compute uh, we gave the prescription how to compute the CMU analyzing the trajectory. If you just uh, whatever the solution you will get the uh, for the CMU, if you just substitute, what you will find is. Okay, yeah, there is somewhere beat particle and eta a eta b equal to one. I'm so maybe let me write it down in the next page. B not equal to A. My screen is frozen. Uh, can you go to your present slide? Yeah, I'm not. Somehow it's something happens. It's some problem of keynote itself. I think, yeah. There is a question. Yes. You can ask. Sachin had a question. Sachin, you can unmute yourself and just ask. Sachin, you can ask the question. Hello.
he's unmuted. Uh, Sachin, can you hear? Maybe he can type the question in the chat and someone can read. Okay. So, uh, so what happens is that you see, so this is, this was the phase factor and this was, this will be multiplied to the full soft factor, whatever we have. And now you see this phase factor basically goes like, if you just forget about this time delay piece, then it goes like, this is order omega, this is log omega. So the phase factor is like order omega log omega. So if it multiplies to the leading soft factor, leading soft factor was one over omega, that can also contribute to order log omega. So basically we expanded the phase factor exponential and keep the one plus the other term. One piece will multiply to the leading, will give the leading soft factor. And here we have written down only the subleading one. So I can... And subleading one basically when multiplied to the leading soft factor, this, the phase factor multiplied to the leading soft factor also gives one contribution to the subleading order. And there is another contribution which is also there at the subleading order. So can one read out the question? Yeah, so Sachin is asking physically how can I understand the time delay? Okay, uh, the physically I think the time delay is telling that uh, like if the some gravity wave is emitting, so it is not now moving in a uh, flat space time, but it is moving in a card space time and the uh, uh, card background is produced by the other particles. So it is basically trying to pull it uh, or pull it back the gravity wave that it is not moving in a speed of light. You know that obviously in card space time, light even don't move uh, at the speed C, but it also delay and this is what is happening. Even you can see this, if you solve the uh, you know, massless particles uh, geodesic equation uh, in a uh, like Schwarzschild metric background. There also you see that the particles don't move in speed C, like for example, as an example, you can see like, uh, like you can see that for the Schwarzschild matrix, say, d square is, plus other term, which other term is dr square upon one minus two gm upon r, plus some square piece, but suppose it is the particle is moving in a radial geodesic, you know that the velocity, radial velocity dr dt turns out to be one upon one minus two gm by r, right? And that, like even in a null, 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 I use basically ds square equal to zero, null geodesic. And you see that, like if you start with that, okay, at leading order, the particle moves at constant velocity at large time, say ct, and just substitute the leading order expression here say um, one upon one minus, I'm telling C to be one, so T. And then your T is large, so you expand it one plus two GM upon T plus dot, dot, dot. And what you will find that this R also here goes like two GM log P, right? And you can see the velocity dr dt is also not like constant one, but it has a correction to it. And so uh, that means like that particle is not moved like the, even the null geodesic is not like moving at a constant velocity C, but it has a correction. And this correction is giving you the effect that there is a time delay to reach a particular distance uh, uh, R, you, do, you should expect that it is, it should be the time should take it is R, but with there is a correction due to this effect. Uh, Sachin, is that answers to your question? Okay. Yeah. So this is precisely this time delay effect, but I think one, it is very hard to observe uh, in a detector because you know there one observes basically the difference between two of the peaks, like suppose if in the gravitational radiation one peak is uh, there and then it goes out in the another peak and people compare the difference between the two peaks and each of the, uh, like the, each of this, each of the gravitational radiation basically reaches, have the same time delay effect. So it is very hard to observe. But probably we have a wide space experiment because it depends on the direction, how, in which direction you are observing because it depends on the direction of the particles moment up, like 
PA dot K factor, PV dot K factor. Some particles are scattering along some direction, and some, you are observing some radiation. So suppose if you put maybe uh, the gravitational wave detectors in various places, obviously on Earth, like if you are observing some uh, say supernova explosion, it's like the angular like on the Earth. If you even put the two pole, the two detector, like this effect will be very small to measure. But probably if you have some wide space experiment and between two different angles, if you measure of the same gravitational wave peak, then possibly one can measure. But in general, uh, like experiment which you set up in a particular spatial region, uh, one cannot observe this effect. But the other piece, this log omega piece, which is due to this backscattering part, this is this basically takes care of the fact that this gravity wave, uh, basically since it is a wave, not a particle, so it will backscatter with the geometry. Those I will uh, derive explicitly this log omega piece, though I have not derived here later. Uh, which basically takes care of the backscattering effect. And the other piece which we have seen here is basically what happens is that if two particles are moving, there is a long range interaction between them. So basically some gravitational interaction is happening between the two particles and the particle is not now moving even asymptotically straight line, but there is some acceleration. And if some particle accelerates, it will radiate. So this is radiating some gravitational uh, wave. So this is basically what is happening. So multiple number of uh, gravitrons are exchanging between them and that is basically feeding uh, the long range gravitational effect and then it accelerates and due to the acceleration it will uh, radiate some gravitational wave. So this is the effect of the last two lines. Which you also have derived uh, as you uh, try getting the long range effect in the trajectory correction and substituting in the naive assumed soft factor. Okay. So up to now, uh, so basically from here, some from some classical understanding and some naive assumption, we have tried to show that uh, one can get some understanding of the soft factor. And we have uh, roughly uh, have given how it will look like, but at least one thing we understood that we should not do a power series expansion. The power series expansion probably breaks down and there have to be log of the soft energy factor at the subleading order. And probably we should, also can derive the soft factor result from quantum S matrix analysis and that will be now our goal uh, and uh, maybe there could be some extra corrections also in the log omega order but at least in the classical limit which we assume in the classical limit probably the extra correction should not contribute and only in for a classical scattering we should get back this result only so with this understanding maybe we can proceed to derive uh, one question. yes so this is a log r term that you wrote down log r inverse plus log omega inverse so right, from right. quantum s matrix analysis uh, mm -hmm. would you get this log r inverse also yes yes we will also get this log r inverse because you know here to get the log r where it is important that where we have put the detector right yes. and you can see so this r basically you can think of it as ir cutoff because you know if from the scattering center if you put a detector distance r then you cannot observe a gravitational wave which wavelength is greater than r so okay. this is a natural uh, cutoff of the resolution for the gravitational wave detector. But in okay. the quantum S matrix, when you derive, we can think of this as a particle scattering and some there is some intrinsic like detector for this scattering. And there, the detector's resolution will be some intrinsic resolution that beyond below some energy the detector cannot observe. So that will be the cutoff uh, will appear in R. And in the classical limit, these two R will be the same because the detector resolution will be just the resolution uh, determined by the distance from the scatter to the detector. So this okay. will appear in the quantum analysis also as a detector resolution, we will see. So before going to uh, analyze the quantum uh, uh, analysis, let me first give that why I are like S matrix is I are divergent in D equal to four. And like still in quantum field theory, we do analysis uh, of uh, S matrix even loop level computation in quantum electrodynamics. Say, and we never like uh, in usual courses, we still get a finite result in the cross section and all such things. So we don't have to think that, okay, there is some, we have, don't have to like think that there will be some independent, uh, like for four space time dimension, probably we have to define a other S matrix, which can take care of this infrared effect more or something like that. But at least physically, we should expect that the cross-section calculus and all these things should go out and we should get a finite result. And this is the observable thing. 
So the observable thing should not affect even though S matrix is higher divergent. That is our expectation. And this is what Weinberg group in his paper, which I have shown in the first lecture. So why, first I will explain why this matrix is higher divergent in D equal to four. So this, let us consider an example first, then we can give some physical understanding. So let's consider some scattering is happening and you are computing a one loop diagram at one loop level. Some photon is running in the loop with momentum L and so P P this is a P A. Okay, maybe I call I called it P A and this is P V. So this is PV plus L. And this is some other part of the amputated, uh, like other part of the amplitude. Let me call this thing as earlier notation some gamma. Okay. So what do you want to say? And suppose this is uh, only one loop diagram you are considering. So this is completely tree level computation, tree level. So that's why let me call this gamma zero for a moment. So if you compute, this endpoint scattering amplitude at one loop level. You, and you take that, you want to only analyze the loop momentum, which is much, much smaller than the finite energy particles momentum, each component. And in this limit, you want to analyze this diagram. What you will see that it involves a D4L upon the four. And since you are approximating it from some IR cutoff, say detector resolution to lambda, where lambda is basically the order of finite energy particles momentum. And in this approximation, you see that the first thing will be this L square minus I epsilon factor for the photon propagator. There will be some vertex factor and that will contact by the item you knew. So that will give a PA dot PB factor and roughly there will be a dot L plus I epsilon for the propagator this and for from the other propagator you will have a PB dot L minus I epsilon, right? And there will be some charge X Q A Q B Qs and some other normalization factors will appear and vertex there will be minus I. So this will be the contribution from this part. And then you just multiply this thing by the tree level contribution. So that is what you will get at one loop level. So now what do you see that you can write down the one loop amplitude when the loop momentum is smaller compared to the finite energy particles momentum in terms of the amplitude, which is completely tree level amplitude and the one loop part completely factored out. Right. Now suppose this is the, so let me call this thing. So, so first of all, one thing you notice that there is a four momentum integration D for L and in the denominator there is L square. There is one factor of L and one factor of L. So this is logarithmically divergent. So what you will get is basically some log of R times lambda times some factor. And it like you, you have to evaluate this integral, you will get some real piece and some imaginary piece. Okay. So let me do it once again. So at one loop level, if you considering in point amplitude is roughly log of small lambda upon capital lambda. Okay, so I'm times 
some real piece plus some imaginary piece. This is this basically you have to do the angular integration part. You can write down the expression and then there will be some endpoint amplitude at three level. Now, if you try to do that, okay, this is a one loop computation, but uh, there can be any number of uh, loop, uh, any number of photons can run in the loop. So you have to sum over all the like two loop, three loop and all diagrams. And like you have to sum over uh, cross channel and other diagrams like you have to, if in two loop level, you have to also this kind of cross diagram and you have to also analyze this kind of diagram. And you just sum over all like all loop order, then what you can see that this expression actually exponentiate. So in when the loop moment, when all the loop moment are much much less than the finite energy particles moment, what you find is that the end loop result for the end particle scattering say will turns out to be. to the power n sorry in loop hold to the power n and then there will be one over n factorial because you know all the photons running in the loop those are identical so you have to multiply by a symmetry factor which turns out to be one over n factorial and that will be multiplied to a in loop result with three level then what you can do is that you sum over one loop to loop and all these things then you can see that this factor really exponentializes and what you will find some exponential times log of lambda r times uh, yes a quick question so mm -hmm. what does it mean when you say a loop momentum is uh, has i mean is uh, soft i mean is smaller than some finite energy particles momentum okay okay so what i want to see that i want to like obviously the loop momentum have to integrate out for all values right right because it's a virtual particle so uh, what i am telling is that I want to analyze the IR behavior of this uh, like loop amplitude. Right. Okay, so for that, I want to restrict that. Okay, the UV behavior probably one can renormalize the theory and it's fine. So I want to put a cutoff that, okay, only the finite energy up to finite energy particles uh, energy. I want to do the analysis and I will okay. put a IR cutoff, which is the detector resolution. And then I want to say that if I take the detector resolution to zero, how this amplitude. Uh, hello. We seems to seem to have oh, lost. Vishwajit, you uh, got sort of disconnected. Can you just repeat the answer? Okay, okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So what I am telling is that uh, we see loop momentum in amplitude. One have to integrate out over the all values. But what we want to analyze is that the IR properties of the loop amplitudes. So okay. for that, we want to restrict that the loop momentum is small. In this region, we want to analyze that how the amplitude uh, will behave. So this is not the full loop amplitude computation, this factorization what now I'm just showing it's only factorizes mm -hmm. only when the loop momentum is small compared to the finite energy particles. Right. And in this, uh, in this way, I want to find that like, how this loop, like basically what happens is that when the loop momentum is small, one can show that if you sum over all loop diagram, then basically whatever you have in the one loop diagram, it exponentiates and it has a logarithmically divergence. So there will be a uh, logarithmic factor to the power log uh, capital lambda and R, where capital lambda is the order of the finite energy particles momentum, R is you can think of the detector resolution. Okay, okay. And uh, this is only the IR behavior of the amplitude, not the full amplitude. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, there is a question from Abhishek. Yes. He's saying that maybe I have missed something. Are the eighth and bth particle massless here? Uh, no, no, those can be massive, massless, anything. So I'm going to say those are massive for, because otherwise I have to also take care of the collinear similarity. So consider those are massive. So now this factor basically gives you lambda times r, right? Now you see when the detector resolution r goes to zero, 
this amplitude basically so okay uh, maybe yeah i'm little so just i think this point just forget i just get me right in the second last next line so when you take this sum over all the amplitude what it will look like is all loop order if you sum over all loop order result what you will get is uh, in point amplitude three level this is what you will get and depending on the sign of this real piece of this amplitude uh, of this integration whatever we have written here explicitly so this is the integral like after doing the logarithmic part of the integral which is the uh, um, which is the mod of the l vector the angular part of the integral one have to do and rest part we are calling this a real and a imaginary to have real and imaginary piece which i will uh, explain later so this sign of this thing will determine that when you will take r going to zero whether the amplitude vanishes or diverges depending on the sign of this real piece so what it is telling is that when you take the detector resolution to be zero in d equal to four the in loop level this matrix becomes ambiguous okay so even what it is telling that in d equal to for the probably this matrix is not uh, well defined due to the infrared property so maybe the one way to resolve this is that maybe we can uh, define a uh, infrared finite matrix and then try to analyze the soft theorem in terms of that that could be one way but what we are taking the way here you see that we are relating the amplitude suppose uh, for the single soft photon or soft graviton theorem we have amplitude in one and we are relating to this some soft factor times an amplitude comma n zero right so if we can show that both side the exponential factors like the exponentiated happens whatever the factor this turns out to be the same then possibly after commuting through the s we can remove these factors right so what if we can show that the gamma n comma one full loop amplitudes some exponential to the power some for electromagnetism say k electromagnetic factor some gamma tilde of n comma 1 and gamma n comma 0 also has the same exponential factor comma 0 then without relating the so okay so and this exponential factor contains the full ir divergent piece as we have seen and the rest of the piece if we think that this is ir finite maybe without relating this two factor if we just cancels out substitute here and cancels out the exponential factor from both side can we relate this gamma tilde n comma 1 by the soft factor gamma tilde in comma 0 so this is the question which we want to ask and the thing is that like the exponentialization of what till now i have shown is basically only in the infrared limit but what we want to do that can like for all moment loop momenta we can break uh, the amplitude in such a way can we can we factor out this uh, a exponent like can we factor out some exponential piece to the amplitude which contains the full ir divergent piece but it may contain some ir finite piece as well and the rest of the amplitude is not only three amplitude but also has co information of the loop amplitude and then but that should not be uh, ir divergent and then in terms of this ir finite dis matrix can we uh, study the soft 
theorem and can we derive the soft factor so this is only uh, like happening for us we are not making individual s matrices to be ir finite but just cancelling the ir divergent pieces from both sides because we are comparing two s matrices if in a, in if you want to find some kind of relation where only one s matrix is involved not comparison of two s matrices then obviously this procedure will be hard to apply so is there any question up to this point yeah bishwajit uh, yes. so uh, this gamma tilde or gamma so is this valid to all loop order or only to one loop i mean like, this uh, yeah this one expression that is actually written down as exponential time gamma tilde right right this one mm -hmm. uh, is this valid to like uh, because uh, previously you carried out the analysis to one loop right 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 so earlier what i was doing only in the infinite limit and uh, what i have shown is that the one loop is actually like oh, this is you can think of roughly whatever we are calling this a real plus a imaginary okay okay and after the like times this log of lambda so the this we have taken and this what we are calling so you can see that at one loop level what we found it, at least in the ir limit it turns out that it exponentializes to all loop order just in terms of the one loop result so we can hope that possibly means this we can analyze up to one loop order and we can check that whether this generalizes to all if we sum over all loop diagrams so that the same one loop result whatever we have exponentiated or not if it exponentiates then it good then we can uh, give tell that our result is one loop exact at least in the ir limit already weinberg uh, shown that it exponentiates but uh, we have to do like in a sense like without first we have to exponentiate this thing or we have to see that whether this exponentiates even without taking ir limit but it should contains the ir divergent piece and then we have to analyze that leaving the divergent piece if we cancel analyze the finite piece and from there even after canceling whether one can have some soft factorization and uh, this ir divergent piece is ek em so mm -hmm. this is is this ir divergent to some particular order in omega or like uh, what what is the general structure of this okay okay so this ir divergent is not like even uh, independent of omega piece so it's not like if you have a n plus 1 particle the one particle so see so you see that it does not like it does not depends on like whether it is gamma n plus 1 amplitude or gamma n zero amplitude and gamma n zero amplitude don't contain the photon so omega information is not there so this ir divergent piece we assume that means we will show that it is completely like independent of the omega information so okay. it is ir divergent in a sense if you do a loop integration then the loop integral diverges in the ir limit and this is uh, not the uv divergent it's ir divergent so that is yeah, uv divergent cut off parameter or something right yeah yeah so i can put like one can show that actually like this factor also can have a uv divergent but we know that uv how to regulate a theory, uv uv regulated theory and since we are uh, trying to understand the soft theorem is a property of the ir uh, the ir physics of the s matrix so you will only only try to um, analyze the ir physics and we will see that uh, when the loop momentum is like greater than the finite energy particles momenta in that regime at least you will not get a soft factor uh, in the omega expansion okay so that so was this factor is uh, so this e uh, k e n uh, so mm -hmm. that is uh, dependent on the cutoff i mean uh, it should depend on how you choose uh, your cutoff right yeah so what i will show that uh, it it turns out to be independent of the cutoff so the up to now what i have shown the uh, weinberg analysis it depends on the cutoff but now i will give a prescription how to do this thing and it will be independent of the cutoff means it's uh, for all loop momenta this will be true not only that loop momentum is smaller than the p okay thank you okay but if you take the loop momentum smaller than the p and take the loop momentum to be zero you will find that it contains the ir divergent piece what uh, already uh, weinberg shown this is yes uh, can you go back to the slide okay uh the second equation uh the soft limit has nothing to do with this like you're not uh, taking the uh, yeah yes yeah, yeah i'm not here taking the soft limits so, okay, so what the, what i will do is that i will start from this gamma tilde and then take soft limit and try to okay. relate it to this factor okay. first without taking soft limit i will try to remove the two exponential from both the side 
Okay, okay, I see, I see. And the claim is that uh, both of them, like gamma n comma one and gamma uh, n comma zero, both have the same. Uh, I yeah, have, at uh, least for I quantum have... electrodynamics, I will show that both have the same exponential. It will cancel. But in case of gravity, I will show that gamma n comma one has some extra higher divergent piece which don't cancel with the exponents, like which don't cancel with the gamma n zero. And this one have to analyze putting some IR cutoff where the detector resolution R will appear, which in the soft factor, this phase factor contains a log R piece. Okay. 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 For QED, it is true that one will have the same uh, exponential piece. I see. So. So the prescription is uh, quite simple. Uh, even like while we prove uh, the gauge invariance of a amplitude in uh, quantum electrodynamics, say, if you replace the polarization epsilon mu by k mu, you can show that uh, they are hard to prove gauge invariance. One uses basically the fact that uh, if you replace epsilon mu by k mu, then basically it factored out to the extreme right and extreme left, and one can move to the extreme right and left, and then using uh, LHD reduction formula, uh, one can show that the is matrix vanishes. This is a standard uh, phase skin derivation. But uh, here are some more thing which uh, one have to understand. So the prescription to do that. So let me tell two steps. So what I will do is basically I will break. Sorry. So I will break the photon propagator. into two piece so sub, you know the in Feynman gauge the photon propagator has this expression okay square plus i epsilon so you break it into two piece you call that one of the pieces minus i times k mu k nu times certain factor so I'm explaining how this factor one will get. And you take care of the other piece. So this is I'm writing the same expression, but uh, basically I have uh, taken some b. So b is the only function of the, uh, okay, maybe I should put a k factor also there. It could depend on the k also. So what I'm do telling is that suppose you have a virtual photon with momentum k and it is connected to some particle with eighth particle and some bit particle with momentum p and pb. Then what you do is that you break it down into this form and let me give the expression for b. Okay, so the press how to find the B, I will just tell. So, so what you are doing is basically you are breaking the photon propagator into two pieces, and this part we will call K photon, and this part just this is just name, 
g photon okay and the goal will be now drawing one diagram which is um, the usual photon you just break it into two diagrams one with k photon and one with g photon this is k photon and this is g photon so in place of one diagram you have to now compute two diagrams and using these two propagator this is the k photon propagator and this is the g photon propagator okay uh, Vishwajit? yes so it's already four maybe try to wrap up in next two three minutes okay okay so so the prescription for like i have written down though the expression for b so how you can find the b is that you demand that the amplitude so what is nb oh sorry eta b so i, I have not sorry explained so this eta and eta b's are basically is plus minus one if the particle is outgoing or incoming so depending on if the particles are outgoing it is plus one and incoming it is minus one okay So the prescription of finding this B is that demand this amplitude if you compete with a K photon propagator, this contains the full higher divergent piece. Okay. So that already implies that if you compute a diagram with a G photon, that will be IR finite. But also with this, for some simplicity, we will assume that if you compute a diagram with a G photon, if there is no external photon or anything, this diagram will vanish. Okay, so this is just a simplicity assumption. Because we don't have to then compute such kind of diagrams. Okay. And the other thing is that you see in the propagator, k photon propagator, we have chosen like a pure gauge kind of form that it is proportional to k mu k nu. How it will help? So it will help in a sense that suppose you have a diagram where basically some k photon is connected here. This is some k photon. If since it is a pure gauge, you can show that this can be written as so let me then put the momentum so there is suppose pc this is then let me uh, call this k so this is k photon and then it is coming in so this is like pc minus k so this amplitude you can you can so this diagram or this is a completely off cell diagram you can write subtraction of these two diagrams So that you can see is basically how this uh, diagram, what will be the Feynman amplitude for this diagram? It will be like one over PC square plus MC square. Then there will be some QC, then some K mu, and then two PC minus K mu times one upon PC minus K whole square plus MC square. And this you can write as QC times one upon PC minus K whole square plus MC square minus QC times one upon PC square plus MC square. So you can think of basically what is happening is that this is uh, K, this is the momentum minus k yeah pc minus k so you think that this diagram is basically propagated pc minus whole square m square times qc so this vertex factor goes so this k mu is coming from the k photon has a part which is proportional to k mu k nu so this k mu contacted with this part and the other is suppose floating and maybe that is connected to some other line with momentum pb so this k mu is if it's contacted with the vertex factor which is coming from this vertex 
contact with this thing you can write as a subtraction of these two term and then you interpret this term as this diagram and this term as this diagram with the circle vertex is basically telling us that you don't have to include any vertex factor except the charge so that will help even in like diagram you have a k photon is connected then you can break it up into the the same diagram where it is connected to the extreme left and right and in that way you can move and the full amplitude in a sense you can write that the, when the k photon is uh, connected to the extreme right and extreme left and in the full amplitude what happens is that uh, if uh, uh, some if then in the external if it is connected to the extreme left and right then starting from the correlation function you just multiply you lsd reduction formula to multiply the propagator inverse then when this kind of diagram vanishes so this will help us to move the uh, uh, like to move the this k photon diagrams to the extreme left and extreme right so i'll uh, maybe explain all these thing detail in the next lectures so any question till now okay let us uh, first thank vishwajit for this uh, wonderful lectures So uh, if there are any pressing question, you can go ahead. Otherwise, we can pause the recording. People can continue to ask questions offline. And we will strictly start the last lecture right on schedule on 4.30 p.m. So if there are no pressing questions, let me pause the video. Then people can ask uh, questions uh, more informally. OK, welcome back to the last lecture of day three. And we will continue with Subbu teaching us supergravity. Over to you, Subbu. Yeah. Uh, so okay. So we'll do a, a recap of uh, the uh, some of the things that that we did last time because an overall recap is uh, was done just in the morning. Okay. So what we did in the second part of uh, in the morning is that we considered uh, a gauge theory of the conformal algebra, which has the generators P A, M A B. D and K, right? For local translations, uh, local Lorentz transformations, dilatations, and special conformal transformations. And when we did this, okay, we noted that when we associate a gauge field to each of these and give a give the transformation uh, by the st uh, structure constants of the algebra, okay, we noted that the P A, okay. So this generates local translations, and by basis change, okay, by a basis change in the uh, transformations, it includes space-time part, of M A B D and K. Okay, so uh, therefore. Uh, these generators M A B D and K A, they generate internal uh, transformations. Okay, in the internal space. For example, when we say dilatations, okay, we mean uh, when we say how something scales under dilatation, we mean uh, its internal conformal dimension. Okay, and similarly. This M A B it generates the spin part of the Lorentz uh, transformation, not the orbital part. Orbital part is absorbed in P A. Okay, this is one step. Okay, and then of course uh, we know how to write the transformation rule, right? Using the structure constants. But if we do this, we are still left with a gauge theory, and it is not clear that it, it is a theory on space-time. Okay, because what is the requirement for a uh, for a theory to be on a space-time? For example, how do we know that local translations are indeed acting as general coordinate transformations? Okay, if they were to act as general coordinate transformations, okay, then P A. So in in space-time. E mu a should should correspond to okay, this was not necessary corresponds to general coordinate transformation okay which is Lie derivatives okay 
which is given by Li derivative. But then here, here there is an additional subtlety, which is that there are additional symmetries here that E mu a uh, obeys, right? Because E mu a has a veil rescaling, okay, which is uh, given because d comma p a is minus, uh, sorry, p a, okay. So delta d of E mu a will be minus E mu a. So it has veil weight minus one. So because D, because EMUA has veil weight minus one, okay, uh, it also tran it also transforms under dilatation. So the Lie derivative here will go to covariant Lie derivative, okay, where the Lie derivative is made covariant with respect to other transforms. Okay. But how do we see that this is true? To see if this if this is true, if it can be done, okay, what we did did is Firstly, we deleted the P transformations. Okay. And the deletion was because if we consider some scalar field, okay. And if we covariantize with respect to uh, P A also, okay. Then, uh, okay, I'll take the question in a minute. Then we, we realized that del mu minus E mu A del A is just zero. Okay. So this is not consistent. Okay. We don't want a covariant derivative, which has no derivative. Okay, that is not how a gauge theory is constructed. Okay, so what we did is we deleted this transformation. Okay. Now the question is, after deletion, how do we know that EMUA indeed generates general coordinate transformations? For that, what we realized is if RP mu nu A is zero, okay, then delta P of EMUA is the same as delta covariant general coordinate transformation of EMUA. Okay, it differed only by RP, okay, and we set it to zero. And that is indeed the torsionless constraint or first Cartan's first structure equation in general relativity. Okay, so Adrita and Abhishek have a question. So why the momentum operator doesn't contain any internal part uh, like the other operators? Okay, um, yeah. Um, okay, I mean, this indeed uh, we had discussed in HRI, <laughs> but uh, I don't exactly remember now. Maybe I can explain in Slack. Okay. I mean, I think in conformal transformations, there is a way to see it because dilatation uh, in conformal algebra is like a, a Casimir of the algebra. Uh, okay. And, uh, um, and because it's a Casimir of the algebra, um, yeah, there is some argument uh, that, uh, in fact, I discussed with Abhishek, but I don't remember now. So I'll 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 uh, post in Slack. Okay, answer it. Uh, yeah, but this is generally true. That translation is not uh, uh, real. Uh, there is no uh, internal part to translations. Uh, yeah, we will discuss it on Slack. Okay, but uh, Manu, uh, oh, is your question clear? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Okay. Okay, so now we saw that RP mu nu A is equal to zero, implied that omega mu AB became a function of the gauge fields E and B. Okay, so that is one thing that we uh, understood. And uh, uh, okay. And then we asked, are there other curvatures which can be used to constrain other gauge fields? Okay, because we are left with E mu A, B mu and F mu A. It still has a lot of degrees of freedom. Okay, and we don't know any such field, okay, in uh, uh, conformal gravity or whatever, uh, because this is just conformal gravity without supersymmetry. We even know the action, even without this formalism, we know this, we know that. Okay. So the resolution to that is, in our M curvature, okay, in the M curve uh, field strength or curvature, okay, uh, F mu A, okay, appears algebraic. Okay, this uh, there might be a proportionality constant here, and everything else is a function of E and B, okay, some function of E and B. Okay, so what that tells us is that if we constrain this left hand side. Okay, then the right hand in the right hand side, this F will get determined in terms of the other fields. Okay, 
So that is done by demanding this condition. Okay. So this will imply f mu a is a function of e. Okay. So, but then one could also think that R D, if you evaluate, that also has f mu a. Uh, algebraically so one could think maybe that can also be used or maybe that provides a consistency condition or something like that okay but and some prop with some proportionality constant okay but then one can derive using this relation which is the bianchi identity for the uh, p field strength okay this is equal to zero will imply that R D mu nu is related to R M mu uh, rho rho nu okay, where rho is excluded from the anti-symmetrization. Okay. So it is related to trace of R M and trace of R M is zero by the con con condition above. Okay. Therefore, if that is zero, R D is also zero. So R D can't be used for this. Is there any question? Okay. So therefore, we are left with two independent gauge fields, E mu A and B mu. Okay. And together, they have uh, 16 plus 4, 20 components. Okay. And we still have the gauge symmetry, even though the other gauge fields became dependent. Okay. We have 15 transformations. This implies five offshell degrees. Okay. But we know that there are six offshell degrees of freedom in Einstein gravity. So we will just act. Uh, so sorry, we'll just add an additional degree of freedom. Okay, we will consider a scalar field in conformal gravity. Y with whale weight one. Okay. This whale weight one, remember, it just means that when you take this del d phi, it transforms as lambda d phi without any other number. Okay. So that is the meaning of having whale weight one. Okay. So if we take this field, then we have six offshell degrees. Of So now let us uh, try to understand okay, how uh, how one writes uh, how one uses this to write uh, Einstein-Hilbert action. Okay, you can consider this Lagrangian okay. We are allowed to write this Lagrangian because delta k of dA dA phi is invariant if phi has whale weight one, which is indeed true, which is what we have considered. Okay. And why does D have a transformation with K? That is because if you consider del mu phi, okay, it is del mu phi. It's a scalar and it only transforms under dilatation in this way. So replace lambda B by minus B mu, the gauge field to construct the covariant derivative. Now to construct the double covariant derivative, note that if you want another covariant derivative, let's call it a d mu d a phi. Okay. Then note that this b mu has a k transformation, which is just, it just goes to the parameter of the k transformation. Okay. So therefore d mu d a phi will become del mu d a phi minus omega mu a b d b phi plus f mu a phi. Shubranil, uh, do you have a question? So more a comment, but maybe you should make it then maybe uh, Abhishek and Adrita can comment also. Oh, yeah, I, 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 it was just a sort of uh, answer to Abhishek and Adrita's question. I think you can continue. If mm -hmm. there are further discussion, we can have it on slide. Okay, okay. What I, earlier what I was referring to is that in De Francisco using like the conformal algebra, 
uh, there is some argument on why translation i mean you can make some argument by using the fact that dilatation is a uh, uh, com- dilation dilatation commutes with every member uh, yeah, I mean, in, I, I don't remember that. Uh, I, in my mind, it's just that every physical field, we typically assume that they are scalar under translation. I mean, they can transform as a vector or a spinner or tensor as you know, the Lorentz. But under yeah, translation, yeah. everything is a scalar. So if you allow the linear momentum to have an internal direction, then that yeah. assumption is actually in contradiction to this fact. So, okay, maybe. Yeah, okay, let's discuss it on Slack. Yeah, okay. So now, okay. So this, okay. So so this d mu d a contains f f because b mu transforms under k transformation so when you take covariant derivative to covariant derivative you have to covariantize with respect to that also okay and another feature which i did not mention is that when you solve for f mu okay the dependent gauge field f mu a This has this is given by this. Okay, so it is expressed in terms of the curvature. Okay, where this curvature is the R M curvature. Okay, R E B mu A is E nu B R M mu nu A B, but with f is equal to zero. Okay, so First, take f is equal to zero. Then take the trace of R M. Then it won't be zero, okay? Because f is what is making the trace to be zero. Okay, so do that, and then uh, whatever R you get, the leftover thing that is this R E B mu. Okay. Once you said B is equal to zero, this will become the Ricci uh, tensor. Okay. So that is why we are interested in this. So you have this act Lagrangian, okay, which has double derivative in phi. Okay, and that contains this f okay and this f is a dependent gauge field and once you express it in terms of independent uh, gauge fields you get some curvature terms okay this is this gives us a hint how this is going towards uh, getting the einstein hilbert action okay so now i won't do every step but i will just write the lagrangian after expressing dependent fields in terms of independent fields f mu mu b mu is equal to 0 now one curious feature here is that b mu does not appear in the action okay okay that is because it is the only independent field that transforms under k transformation okay so that means that if the action has to be invariant under k transformation then b mu must disappear once you express every dependent field in terms of independent fields okay that is what has happened here okay so b mu just disappears from the action okay so uh, what we can do is uh, okay so just uh, use the expression for uh, f okay then we are we obtain this action phi del mu del mu phi uh, minus r over 6 pi square okay this this r came from this f mu nu f mu nu okay now this is an answer to anish's question earlier about like how the scalar is coupled to coin carry gravity so you could come from the reverse way okay you can begin with this action and then couple a scalar field like this but this coefficient has to be 1 over 6 okay and nice. also also this sign is the wrong sign for the kinetic term of the scalar Right. I don't know. I don't know if I have it written in the right way here, but uh, if you analyze it carefully, it, it is the wrong sign. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. So now, 
notice that we want to obtain Poincare gravity and that won't have these additional symmetries such as the K symmetry and dilatation symmetry. Okay. So what we do is we gauge fix K and D. Okay. To gauge fix K, we can just say B mu is equal to zero. And B mu does not appear, does not even appear in the Lagrangian. Okay, therefore it plays no role. You can set it to zero. And since B mu goes as uh, lambda k mu, this completely fixes the k transformation. The way this is done is delta B mu is del mu lambda d, okay, uh, plus lambda k mu, okay, and uh, if you also say delta B mu is equal to zero, this implies lambda K mu is equal to del mu lambda. Okay. So before completely gauge fixing it, what you have to do is for every field which transforms under K, you do this compensating gauge transformation. Okay. But it won't be necessary because we will shortly gauge fix dilatation also. Okay. So basically this is enough to gauge fix this transformation. Okay, is that part clear? Because B mu is like pure gauge under uh, special conformal transformations. Okay. And uh, to fix dilatation, what we do is set this constant phi to root six by root two kappa. Okay. Uh, this is just a uh, uh, convention. Okay, this all is root six by root two, so that we get the Einstein-Hilbert action. So this implies, okay, so if phi is set to a constant, its kinetic term will go away, right? And we had R phi square earlier, right? So that we had minus one over six R phi square, right? So that will just become minus one over two kappa square, So we started with conformal gravity and then we gauge fixed dilatation and special conformal transformations and we obtained the Einstein Hilbert action. Okay. So this is the technique that we will use in supersymmetry okay, to construct Poincare supergravity actions by constructing kinetic actions for matter multiplets in conformal supergravity, which is easier. Okay. Is this clear? Uh, so can you just restate the last statement? Okay, so the statement is that here what happened is action for phi in conformal gravity, right? That is what we constructed initially, which is this, which is this action, this action, right? This is the action that we constructed by using conformal algebra, right? Right. Now, after gauge fixing, it gave us this action. Okay. Gauge fixing. Gave us Einstein Hilbert action, right? Yeah. In point carry gravity. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this tells us that, uh, I mean, this tells us that we, we can use this technique to build uh, such Lagrangians in Poincare gravity. Okay. And in supergravity, it is extremely useful because in supergravity, if one has to find by brute force, the supersymmetric completion of some Lagrangian in Poincare supergravity, it is very difficult. So what one does is this is a matter field, right? Phi. Okay. So consider a matter field in conformal gravity, construct its action and find the, find the kinetic action for gravity in Poincare supergravity. Okay. So such matter fields are called as compensating fields. Okay. And they come up with the wrong sign and the fields used for compensation, uh, they do not have any dynamical degrees of freedom. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this finishes my uh, treatment of uh, uh, conformal gravity. We will go to uh, n is equal to two conformal supergravity and uh, 
we will go to the details. So if there are any questions at this point, I am happy to take them. Because from now on, we'll go to the uh, technical part. Uh, why are you skipping n equals 1? I thought that would be more simpler or something. Is that not the case? Oh, I mean, yeah, it may be more simpler, but n is equal to 2 is very interesting. I mean, n is equal to 1 is indeed simpler. n is equal to okay. 2 is more interesting uh, because there are many features in extended ah. supersymmetry that are visible in n is equal to 2. And okay. also, and also uh, there are, uh, so you, you can try to write down like general actions okay in uh, mm -hmm. uh, n equal to 2 n equal to 3 n equal to 4 and so on n is equal to 2 is in the right uh, you know uh, whatever goldilocks zone right. where it is not too constrained but it is also uh, constrained enough to find something so i see yeah okay. and also most of the black hole entropy computations were done i mean were done in n is equal to 2 supergravity i see okay okay yeah because the n is equal to force high derivative supergravity action was con constructed only like in 2016 or 2017. So, I yeah. see. Yeah. Okay. Are there any more questions? Okay. So, let me go on. So, we will also discuss n is equal to three subconformal supergravity and some general. Uh, features of n is equal to, I mean, n extended conformal supergravities. Okay, throughout this. Uh, one more quick question. Yeah. Uh, so, in the gauge fixing process, uh, when you sort of try to make sure that you remove that uh, the connection for the translation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, so you ended up with a necessarily uh, a second order formulation. Yeah, yeah. So, is it at all possible to go to a first order for, uh, formulation using this method? Uh, no, I don't think so. It's not possible. Okay. Yeah. We discussed so, earlier so also about something uh, like, I am not sure like uh, uh, the first order formulation works for higher derivative theories. And this is an off shell method, right? So, uh -huh. so here, like we want second order formulation so that we can construct any general Lagrangian. I see. So no, I'm I'm thinking like in the in the case of usual uh, n equal to one supergravity, uh, you use this 1.5 order formalism to make things simpler. Yeah, but that is an on shell that is the on shell supergravity formalism. Ah, okay, okay, okay. And using that, people only construct like the minimal, uh, the universal part of supergravity. Supergravity. The right, way Friedman right. calls it. But right, uh, right. conformal supergravity is what is used to obtain matter coupled supergravity theories. I see. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I understand. Okay. So, in n is equal to 2 conformal, so, so we will also discuss more generalities of other, uh, you know, uh, n supergravities. So, this is curly n. But we will just stick to one so that we introduce various multiplets in this. So here, uh, also I have a uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, I oh, have a sorry. slightly tangential yeah. question. Um, uh -huh. uh, is that the you you are going to discuss mostly classical aspects? Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, I mean initially I found Susi interesting was because uh, it's UV finite, right? For like usual uh, supersymmetry, it makes sure that uh, you don't like uh, end up with infinities or the results are mostly one loop. And it's equal to four super young mills, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, any rigid Susi that that seems to work. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, when it comes to gravity, uh, I assumed that that was the case even for supergravity. Uh, but uh, in informal conversations uh, with people, I've, I've come to know that it is not necessarily finite. At some higher loop or something, there are some issues. Uh, yeah. Is there a reason I think we, why? I think people don't know yet. Oh, okay. I don't know a reason. I don't know a deeper reason. Basically, people uh -huh. ba basically people expect like divergences to cancel because of fermionic terms, right? Right. Like cancellations between bosonic and fermionic uh, divergences. But what right. happens is that, uh, like, I mean, in uh, without gravity, that is indeed the case. But with gravity, it is not guaranteed. And the computations, uh -huh. are, I, as far as I know, are still being done. Like, uh, uh, there is a big group, I think, in US and Europe. Uh, okay. they, did, they did some five loop uh, supergravity amplitude computation. And, okay. uh, but as far as I know, it did not settle the question. Like, uh, as, as, as in, uh, like, there is, uh, people expect that uh, it may not be UV finite. Some 
very few people accept expect that it may be ub finance but it okay. is not it is not known it is not settled i see so there is no like a quick way of like uh, i mean arguing either way i mean uh, because, oh, i mean not that i clear. not that i know of no no i mean it's just that when gravity is there right i mean the, uh -huh. it is much harder to quantize so right uh, okay super, so you would think that supersymmetry might cure it but uh, right. uh, yeah it is not known whether that will happen i see i see and okay. the way like i uh, study, study conformal supergravity or poincare supergravity is like poincare supergravity is like low energy uh -huh. limit of string theory so it okay. is interesting for high derivative corrections to black hole entropy so right. i haven't looked at it uh, this way that much i see i see okay Okay, so in n is equal to two conformal supergravity, what you do is you have more generators now, right? These are the bosonic generators, okay, and these are the fermionic generators, okay, omega mu a b, b mu, f mu a. You so associate a gauge field uh, to each of these uh, generators. Okay, and this is SU two now. Okay, this this is SU two. Uh, and psi mu i and phi mu. Okay. So uh, now, of course. Uh, by the algebra we will know various things about this like we will know what is the whale weight of each of these right because we know the whale weight of this right and we know the whale weight of the covariant derivative okay using that we can get the whale weight of all these objects okay or we get the whale weight of like transformation parameters let us say and this will be the same whale weight okay so this has for example whale weight minus 1 okay and uh, Actually, I don't remember the whale weights of everything. So this is zero. This is zero. This is zero. This is minus half. This is plus half. Okay. So this much at least I remember. So now you can similarly get the chiral weight also. This is zero, 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 and uh, minus half. Basically, they have the opposite weights that uh, compared to that of the generators. Okay. Uh, okay. Chiral weight, I think, is the same. Yeah. yeah. So, so now, uh, so now, what uh, what we need to do is do a similar analysis as before. Okay. Where uh, where we ask. Uh, so, of course, we can realize this as a gauge theory, but to act on space time. Okay. Uh, the uh, P transformation sh uh, uh, should be deleted, and we should instead have covariant general coordinate transformation. But the new feature now is that in the other generators, okay. QQ closes to P, right? So what that tells us is that if we delete P, okay, the commutator of Q supersymmetry might might better close to covariant general coordinate transformations okay so if you demand this then what you will get is that so this will imply okay so if you have let us say rp mu nu a to be zero so this will in, uh, this will ensure that uh, e mu a uh, uh, is the this will ensure that e, e mu e mu a uh, transformations will close Okay, to covariant general coordinate transformations, and if you consider various fields, okay, then you will get all these all the constraints. Okay, so for now I will write these quote unquote unconventional constraints because of what I am going to uh, define later, which are conventional constraints and gamma mu R Q mu nu i to be zero. Where R Q mu nu i is the curvature corresponding to supersymmetry, okay, to the to gravity now, okay, uh, this field. So in supersymmetry, as far as I know, it is much nicer to derive these constraints in the sense that 
there we can only we could only derive this elegantly i did not know how to derive this elegantly okay it, uh, uh, in a lot of references it is given in a lot of way but uh, uh, a very simple approach seems to be lacking okay now this um, but here just by this demand okay all the constraints can be obtained and it can also be understood this way if you just take this constraint and then take, take the supersymmetry transformations okay then you will get the other two constraints one after the other so the constraints form a multiplet of their own okay they re they realize the supersymmetry algebra as well okay so therefore you have these constraints now uh, is that okay okay uh so good quick question uh -huh. uh so suppose i wanted to relax one of these uh, constraints that you have okay uh then it necessarily has to modify the supersymmetry algebra is it the q q bar going to p i don't think you can relax only one of these constraints if you relax one all the others are also relaxed in some way i see so it's not possible to keep like the first constraint uh, 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 the, true but the other two is not possible to relax you will you will break supersymmetry ah okay okay because the that, constraint that... is not invari uh, invariant under suci okay okay so here all the constraints together they form a multiplet in that sense the set of constraints is invariant under supersymmetry i see, I see. okay but okay. but an individual constraint is not invariant under supersymmetry okay okay and that okay. is very important also so thanks for asking that question so that implies so since they are individually not invariant when you solve this right this will change the q transformation of omega okay solving this condition will change the mm -hmm. q transformation of omega because because if you because only this equation is used right the only rp is equal to zero equation is used to solve for omega in terms of other fields okay right and that equation is not invariant under supersymmetry okay so that mm -hmm. is why unlike the earlier case where the constraints had no effect on the transformation stand, transformation under standard gauge transformations okay here mm -hmm. once you uh, uh, once you solve you one constraint okay that changes the transformation rule of this omega right right okay okay yeah so these are the three constraints so this will make so the first one will make omega mu a b dependent okay and and function of psi also and this will make uh, f mu a dependent and this will make uh, phi mu i dependent okay so the s supersymmetry transformations become dependent okay that is what is new okay and there is an additional uh, subtlety now okay so one thing i have always hidden so far is uh, related to the question arna bas earlier okay which is when i wrote the conformal algebra all the super, or the super conformal algebra i wrote it in in terms of abstract generators okay algebra which is t a t b is equal to f a b c t c okay so if we have this algebra this is called as the hard algebra so in the comments what is happening is it related to n is equal to 8 super gravity or is it something uh, rele uh, i mean directly relevant all, all n equals to 8 super gravity ah okay okay yeah okay yeah so so ta tb goes to f a b c t c okay so this is the hard algebra because these are abstract generators right so they are not associated with any fields or anything so these are what we usually cons consider in any uh, you know field theory course uh, or group theory course when we uh, you know study gauge theory or group theory okay but there is also a notion called as soft algebra okay this is given by the fact that the transformations also realize the algebra okay if you take like epsilon 1 epsilon 2 okay on some field okay on some field that will also realize the algebra okay 
okay this will be some delta epsilon 3 of phi where epsilon 3 a will be some uh, uh, f b c a epsilon 1 b epsilon 2 c okay so this this is also true in our gauge theory okay so what is different what is ha huh? this yeah. PATV here are the generators of a c n group is that right or oh, any group i mean any i mean any algebra the way we studied it so far right in our courses okay. is is as abstract generators right so therefore yes. there is no notion of equation of motion there okay mm -hmm. but the algebra can also be thought of as being realized on fields this way okay so when you because this this is also true in our sun gauge theory or any gauge theory that we considered so far if you do two consecutive transformations and take the commutator that will give you another transformation given by the algebra okay except the new thing that can happen now is that now these parameters okay soft algebra means that parameters can become field dependent okay so so what is what is happening here is that earlier there were no fields right so that is one thing okay and the other thing is that okay so yeah so this is what i want to discuss now but com uh, coming back to what we discussed earlier like with arna okay there is another feature which is related to something called a zilch symmetry that when you think of it this way as acting on fields okay then it can also close up to equations of motion okay so when you when you evaluate the algebra on the fields okay and you get some some other transformation okay according to the algebra hard algebra and some equations of motion as well okay you might think that um, you might think that you found a new symmetry right because when you take the commutator of two symmetric transformations it should be a sum of other symmetry okay but equations of motions are trivially symmetries of any action right because they are conserved always right so therefore all the noether charges are zero on shell okay so that so that symmet such a symmetry is called a zilch symmetry which is what happens in on shell uh, supersymmetry okay so that is so when you think of soft algebras okay then two things can happen parameters can become field dependent and there can be equations of motion on the right hand side of the algebra okay uh, is that all right i yes. have a question yeah uh, so uh, i mean usually uh, you think of the action of uh, the variation on the field you think of it as a representation of the algebra on on, on fields yeah yeah uh, but in this case that is uh, some of that that is not i mean when you say a soft algebra that is presumably not what is happening it is a representation of you define this as the algebra okay this equation okay okay and delta delta phi is a representation of this uh, this algebra uh okay 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 I, okay okay so then your structure constants okay and your mm -hmm. uh, uh, okay i mean transformation parameters maybe i should just uh, change it a little bit okay maybe i can say i'll i'll explain later how this happens so structure okay. constants can become field dependent yeah so my understanding was that um, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, of course i have not seen this before uh, mm -hmm. but i thought that this has to be the case even at the level of the abstract algebra or something or, i mean is it possible that you have an abstract algebra that has uh, that does not have a field dependent structure constant but the representation of that algebra on fields has a field dependent structure constant i find that a bit confusing no it is just that when you have the abstract algebra right there are mm -hmm. no fields right it is just some group Okay, so the algebra of some group, okay? Right. But but here you you have the uh, fields as well, right? Okay. And when you realize uh, that algebra, then you could think that okay, you want to realize hard algebra, okay? Okay. But you could also have these more general structures, okay? Okay. Uh, and that would still uh, you know uh, 
I mean, if you think of it this this way, then it is consistent. Yeah, if I forget that this came as a representation of a hard algebra, I suppose that uh, that seems okay. I mean, in by yeah. in, by independently, if I just think of the soft algebra uh, as some algebra that I mean came from somewhere, uh, mm -hmm. I I think that 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 is uh, satisfactory in some sense. But if I think of it as a representation of a hard algebra, I, somehow I don't know. Maybe it's just my okay. Ignorance. Okay, so what happens is that okay in supersymmetry, what happens is that even though structure constants become field dependent, okay, right. These the the structure constants become field dependent on auxiliary fields, which we will soon define. Okay. 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 And when they become field dependent on auxiliary fields, okay, then once you eliminate the auxiliary fields, okay, by okay. some Lagrangian, okay, okay, using some Lagrangian, then it will go back to the hard algebra. Oh, I see, I see, I see. So it's it's, it's some intermediate step where uh, uh, these things are there because you want some offshell uh, uh, action or something. Yeah, I mean that is also a part of it in the sense that, but but I mean soft algebras are more general in the sense that suppose you consider the super Young Mills uh, Lagrangian, right? Okay. And okay. the transformation rule. If you evaluate delta Q one, delta Q two, which is the Susi commutator. Okay. Okay. I mean, of course, it's anti-commutator for the generators, but because field transformation parameters also are also Grassmannian, right, right, this right. becomes the commutator. Now, if you take mu, okay, even just mm -hmm. the vector multiplied, okay, uh -huh. you would think that this would close as minus one over two epsilon bar two uh, gamma mu, okay, gamma nu epsilon one, okay, uh, p nu, which is like del nu, right? Del nu right, mu. Right. Correct. But this uh -huh. is not gauge invariant, for example, right? The right, right. hand side. So right, what right. what happens is when you actually do this, you will get this answer, del mu n. Okay. Ah, uh, okay, 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 okay. Where uh, del mu n u? Sorry, sorry. Where this I is see. thought of as a field dependent uh, gauge transformation. Okay. Of I see, I see. Okay. I see. I see. I see. So yeah. Um, so th this is like, uh, for example, gauge covariantizing the lead derivative uh, on. Uh, uh, I mean, if I take the usual yeah. lead derivative on a gauge field, uh, it's not covariant. Yeah, that is gauge. also responsible for this. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. So there are multiple things responsible for this. That's why I'm not able to pin down like one and say this will get solved. But yeah. I see. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Like even in our earlier case when we considered only conformal gravity. Okay. Uh mm -hmm. There also because we considered like covariantized uh, this thing. Uh, lead derivative there also mm -hmm. we would have the soft algebra but i just avoided going into that okay okay right okay okay yeah and, and uh, do these soft algebras uh, satisfy jacobi identity yeah yeah they satisfy jacobi identity yeah because jacobi identity is just a property of the lhs right yeah. but it, it has some useful things to say about the rhs okay but i won't use all that here so there is this paper called soft gauge Algeb algebras by Sohnius. Okay. I think uh, 1972 or something like that. Okay. So that uh, has a lot of details on these uh, soft algebras. And I think, uh, and I think their application is more uh, vast than supersymmetry because uh, recently, even in Geoffrey compare stock, he was also mentioning that they have soft algebras. So, I mean, I think it's a general feature. These are called as Lie algebraics in mathematics, and they appear whenever there is this uh, Lie derivative being covariantized as well. So they somehow constrain the behavior of these auxiliary fields. Uh, I mean, uh, the structure constants, yeah. The yeah. structure constants. That is uh, discussed very neatly in this uh, paper by Sonius. Yeah. And there is one more feature of these soft algebras, which is that. There are two things that we demand from a covariant derivative, and these are usually equivalent for hard algebras. Okay. One is that it contains its transformation contains no derivative of the gauge field. This is one purpose. And the second thing is that it, it forms a representation of the algebra. Okay. 
its transformation forms a, forms a representation of the algebra for hard hard algebras this this is equivalent okay when there are no field dependent structure constants these notions are equivalent okay whereas for soft algebra this is not equivalent for soft algebras this is true only if the algebra closes off shell but we want this nice feature of the covariant derivative okay in conformal supergravity and we also want uh, the algebra to close off shell because we we can construct general actions if we have an off shell representation okay so that is why we introduce auxiliary fields d tab and chi i okay so i am not going to count the number of components okay but our discussion so far has told us that the following fields are independent okay maybe here i can count the uh, number of components okay so this is uh, Uh, i runs from 1 to 2 right so that is 2 multiplied by psi is a maharana spinner so it is 4 and there are four uh, indices corresponding to mu okay that is uh, 8 times 4 32 okay and chi i is also 2 into 4 right which is 8 so that is uh, uh, 4 into 2 8 so that is 40 and how many number of so these are the number of components of fermions and how many number of uh, transformation parameters we have we have qi and si right both have 2 times 4 because it's, both are maharana spinners right so 8 plus 8 16 so 40 minus 16 is 24 okay so the multiplet that we obtain is called as the whale multiplet and this is called a standard whale multiplet and it has 24 plus 24 of shell degrees of freedom is that clear sorry can you repeat the count once again okay so each of these are uh, maharana fermions okay psi chi and so on okay i mean i considered them as chiral projections of maharana but the, the other projection is also there so which i am not writing so therefore psi has four components spinner by fermion index Okay, that is this four. Okay, mu is space-time index which runs over four. Okay, and i is the SU two index which runs over two. Okay, so two times four, four times four is thirty-two. Okay, and chi i is two SU two and four fermion index. So two times four is eight. Okay, so thirty-two plus eight is forty, and q i and s i are two times four and two times four. 8 plus 8 which is 16 so 40 minus 16 is 24 is that okay yeah okay okay and you can so i leave it as an exercise to count the bosonic uh, you know like degrees of freedom and subtract it by the bosonic transformation parameters okay which are still uh, which are, which are uh, i mean 15 plus this su2 and uh, the uh, chiral u1 so now i just gave you these auxiliary fields okay but one way to get this auxiliary fields is maybe by guess work okay because you want to know like what are the uh, independent what are the number of degrees of freedom uh, you can have to match both sides okay for example we added eight um, uh, eight fermionic degrees of freedom which are auxiliary so before that be, sorry before that we had uh, Uh, 16 okay 16 degrees of freedom so uh, and i think we have we have added seven uh, uh, degrees of freedom which is bosonic okay so we could guess it but there is another procedure which is called as the current multiplet procedure
where what you do is consider let's say n is equal to 2 super young males okay i i won't write the action and so on okay i will just explain the principle uh, because these calculations are tedious okay so consider n is equal to oh, okay sorry n is equal to 2 super young males okay and construct t mu nu in terms of super young males feeds okay this we all know how to do okay but given an action we know how to construct the energy momentum tensor okay. so once you do that okay. you we know the transformation of the fields okay using that so construct the multiplet which has t mu nu. Okay, that is start with t mu nu, keep taking supersymmetry transformations, okay, and analyze what kind of fields you can get, okay, composite fields out of the fundamental fields of super young males, okay. So that multiplet is called a supercurrent multiplet. Then what you do is you couple the supercurrent multiplet by a first order action to linearize supergravity fields. Okay. Plus so on. When you take supersymmetry variation of energy momentum tensor, you get a Fermi current, okay, which you are, you have coupled to psi mu i. And there is there will be some other fermionic current which couples to phi mu i, okay, and so on. Okay, there are various fields. And in fact, this is what we do, right? When we when we couple uh, energy momentum uh, tensor, okay, perturbatively to some action, okay, then this is what we do. Okay. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Okay, let's so now we know the transformation of these, right? Because these are composite objects in terms of the fields of super young males, okay? Using this transformation, okay, demand that this S order one action, okay, demand of super gravity fields, okay? We we chose super young males because it has uh, super young males has conformal invariance in four dimensions, which is the reason we chose super young males. Okay, and uh, and because of this, we obtained the conformal supergravity fields. Okay, not only does it have psi mu i, it also has phi mu i. Okay, because it has the conformal currents. Okay, so is this part clear? Okay, so this is the process. Okay, so construct energy momentum tensor in terms of fundamental fields. Because you know the transformation of fundamental fields, you know the transformation of the energy momentum tensor multiplet. Okay, you construct this first order action. Okay, and using this first order action, you can you construct couple it to supergravity fields and get linearized supersymmetry variations. Okay, and let me just copy paste this uh, equation to the next slide. Okay, so this is the action that we have. Now, wh what what we have is that del mu t mu nu is equal to zero will imply that h mu nu has gauge symmetry. Okay, similarly for other fields. Okay. Because 
what will happen is okay maybe i can show for a simple field suppose we have a field v mu in the current multiplet which is conserved okay and i couple it to some field a mu okay so this is a current this is a field okay so now if if this changes by gauge transformation okay now you can do integration by parts and bring it to del mu v mu epsilon of x and because this is conserved right this is zero okay so if you have a conserved current okay you get a gauge field okay but what happens is that the full multiplet you remember when we analyzed even on shell supersymmetry representations in uh, uh, massless suci representations we saw that gauge field might come with other fields which are not gauge fields okay so even in the current multiplet okay the full multiplet has non conserved currents okay they are just called currents because they are in this multiplet okay so what happens is that conserved currents imply gauge gauge fields give you gauge fields of the super conformal algebra and non conserved currents will give you matter fields so therefore we we need not do any guess work okay if we take like let's say n is equal to 4 super young mills and then we take it super current multiplet couple it to super gravity fields in using this action and demand its invariance we will get linearized supersymmetry variations of this action then you just have a technical task okay so once you get so maybe i can keep this for like few more seconds okay so once you do that task what you have is linearized super gravity variations so there are transformations to go to non linear transformations okay use super conformal algebra okay use the super conformal that will give you non linear transformation while doing this you have to also impose constraints impose curvature constraint this will give us the auxiliary field content as well as the transformation rule and it's a very efficient method to get the veil multiplet in conformal supergravity okay and i i will just write the algebra okay so delta q of epsilon 1 delta q of epsilon 2 after all this okay will be delta cgct of that field plus a field dependent m transformation a field dependent k transformation a field dependent s transformation and any gauge symmetry that that field might have now these field dependent transformations okay uh, including the xi okay uh, okay xi is field dependent in the sense that it depends on the veil bind and this depends on this field the anti self dual part of this field tab and so on okay so this is the super conformal algebra and it is extremely powerful once you have the linear variation of super uh, supersymmetry okay for super gravity multiplet all the non linear variations what you do is considers the transformation of some field okay it will have some veil weight some chiral weight some lorentz symmetry structure okay add all possible fields okay on the right hand side which has those symmetries which has that veil weight that chiral weight that lorentz symmetry structure that fermionic structure okay then all the constants all the undetermined constants are determined by supersymmetry algebra okay this 
this soft algebra. Is uh, that so, yeah? I am bit confused here. So uh, this algebra that you have written down is a is again a soft algebra, right? Yeah, yeah. It is a, so. Then uh, when you say that uh, you super conform an algebra, uh, so uh, aren't you using the hard algebra, meaning of the structure function that you wrote down earlier? Uh, okay, I mean these also have like the same. Uh, okay, I mean these also have the same structure constants plus some modifications, which are like okay. field. Uh, yeah. So uh, so these that's that is why these are also called a super conformal algebra. Okay, okay. Okay, so those modifications can be like rigorously, uh, like sort. You can classify what kind of modifications happen, but I'm I am not doing that because we have no time. But uh, yeah. And uh, when you say that uh, you still have nonlinear uh, symmetries, mm -hmm. I mean sorry, nonlinear uh, field transformations. Yeah. So they are like, uh, how will that look like? Because. Uh, I mean, uh, why are you calling that in the first place linear field transformation? Because they are linearly dependent on the. Oh, okay, okay. So, okay, maybe I can. Yeah, yeah, I should have answered that. Suppose some field. I mean, I should have explained that. Suppose some field under Q transformation goes to derivative of some field. Okay, derivative of another field. Okay. So this is what you will get from first order action. Okay, partial derivative. Okay, this is linearized. Okay. So when you, uh, so what you have to do after you get get this from the uh, first order action, is that you have to uh, to nonlinearize it. Okay. You have to make it covariant derivative. Of that field. But then covariant derivative firstly is nonlinear, right? In the sense that you will have the gauge field times this field appearing many at many places. That is one nonlinearity. And another thing is that we know that this is not sufficient. Okay, there will be many additional terms that are required to close the supersymmetry algebra after making partial derivatives into covariant derivatives. Okay, all these terms are called as nonlinear terms. And they are dis de determined by the algebra. Okay, in the sense that their structure is determined by chiral weight, veil weight, and other symmetry properties, but the coefficients are all fixed by superconformal algebra. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So now, of course, what I should mention is. Superconformal algebra is much much more powerful. In fact, suppose someone gave you the chiral weight, veil weight of all these fields. Okay, then even the linear terms you can derive using the superconformal algebra. Okay, just write all possible terms. Okay, and then allow all possible terms on the right hand side of the algebra. Okay, just by the fact that uh, you know uh, E mu a has some universal. Uh, Algebra, okay, e mu i and psi mu i, okay. Every other transformation can just be derived using the superconformal algebra. Okay. In fact, this is what Bindusar and I did for n is equal to three supergravity. Okay. Because in n is equal to three supergravity, okay, n is equal to three super Young means is equivalent to n is equal to four super Young. Okay. Therefore, this procedure breaks down, right? Because if you take the current multiplet of whatever you will call as n is equal to three super angles, okay, it is related by field redefinition. So n is current multiplet of n is equal to four super n. What this means is that you wrote the n is equal to three super angles action. In a way which does not make the n is equal to four supersymmetry manifest, okay, but it is still there, okay, imposed by Lorentz symmetry, okay, because once we add CPT conjugate states to any multiplet which has less than spin two, then the field content is the same as n is equal to four, and CPT uh, theorem is by Lorentz invariance, okay, so Lorentz invariance of the action is forcing us uh, to include to realize that there is also n is equal to four supersymmetry. 
so this current multiplet procedure breaks down okay uh, neetu is this clear if you are here yeah okay so okay van muiden and van proen uh, the same van proen of the book okay so in 2017 they overcame this obstruction by considering the current multiplet for n is equal to 4 super animals okay and then they truncated it truncated to n is equal to 3 current multiplet because remember our issue is with writing an action for this fundamental fields okay so that they have only n is equal to 3 super symmetric whereas the current multiplet is not a field for which you have to write the action it is a it is a set of composite fields right so for the current multiplet okay you can have an n is equal to 3 multiplet okay so what they did is that they took the n is equal to 4 current multiplet and they did a truncation for example they took uh, j mu i okay and they divided this into j mu alpha or okay i don't know what notation to use okay this is kannada j mu a and j mu 4 okay and they left this j mu 4 okay because that they don't need and they asked is there a multiplet where only these this this index which runs from 1 to 3 okay is there a multiplet where only this these indices mix among each other okay and they obtained such a multiplet coupled it to super gravity fields and they obtained n is equal to 3 wave multiplet okay but the issue is for some reason their entire computation had so many errors both in the transformation rule and in the uh, uh, field dependent structure constants that they listed okay so the multiplet was not useful so what bindu sir and i did is that we already had the field content in fact even before they constructed this multiplet the field content was known uh, earlier due to some other uh, reasons okay by some other approaches so we just assumed the field content took all the chiral weights veil weights and we added all possible uh, terms on the right hand side of the uh, transformation rule and using the algebra we could determine every coefficient up to some field redefinitions which is allowed anyway okay so that is uh, whatever uh, that is the paper by bindu sar and i which was a comment on this paper and later they also found out that they uh, they uh, i mean they were also doing the correction it seems and uh, it came out to be the same as us okay and also i should mention that this multiplet that we have is called the standard veil multiplet and whenever we say so far okay we have had the standard veil multiplet and whenever one speaks of standard veil multiplet veil multiplet okay this is the multiplet which involves all the gauge fields of the super conformal algebra okay so veil multiplets in involves all the gauge fields of the super conformal algebra plus some auxiliary fields okay but one could ask is this choice of auxiliary fields unique okay the answer to that is no this is not unique okay in d is equal to 6 5 and 4 dimensions there is a multiplet called as the dilaton veil multiplet which has uh, uh, which has some other auxiliary fields not here we had d t a b chi this has some other gauge fields okay dilaton veil multiplet and uh, this was constructed by by berkshof et al for phi d i don't i don't remember who constructed it in 60 and this was constructed by butter et al uh, butter lodato and uh, bindu sar and i okay we constructed it in 4d okay and in 4d it was also expected by string theory considerations that uh, uh, okay it's not bad batter it is butter so uh, by string theory constructions also it was expected that such a multiplet would exist 
So this is all about the whale multiplet. Okay, but we only have the conformal gravity multiplet. Now we will see the compensator multiplets. Are there any questions? Okay. So in the compensator multiplets, there is a vector multiplet which has fields x, which is a complex scalar, omega i, which is a doublet of Marana fermions, w mu, which is a u1 gauge field, which is why it is called as vector multiplet, and yij. Okay, this is a three representation of SU2. So i, j are symmetric. Okay. So this is the vector multiplet and this is the auxiliary field. Okay. There is some transformation rule, but if you set y, i, j is equal to zero, okay, then, uh, then you get the uh, on-shell vector multiplet. Okay. But this, this field is needed for the off-shell completion. So Madhu had, uh, had some, Madhusudan Raman had some comments about n is equal to two vector multiplet okay now that the field content is here he can say something is he there hi i think madhu got disconnected he's having some internet troubles ah okay okay yeah okay so i'll continue then okay. this is called as the vector multiplet okay and this has 8 plus 8 off shell degrees of freedom simplest thing is to count the fermions right there are i goes from 1 to 2 so this is 2 Marana spinner as four, so four times two is eight. Okay. You could also count here. This is three. This is also three. And yij satisfies this reality condition. Y upper ij, which is the complex conjugate of y lower ij. Is epsilon ik, epsilon j. Okay, therefore, this is real in some sense, real triplet, so three. Okay. And this is two. So three plus three plus two is eight. So eight plus eight for bosonic plus fermionic off shell degrees of freedom. Okay. So this will be used as a compensator multiplet because we have many extra symmetries than Poincare supergravity, right? We have the SU two R symmetry. We have the dilatation symmetry. We have the U one R symmetry. Okay. So this will be one of the compensating multiplets. Okay. So let me go to tensor multiplet. So I'm not giving the transformation rule, etc., because it becomes extremely tedious. Okay. L i j. Okay. G. E mu mu. Phi i. Okay. These are the fields of tensor multiplet, where this is a tensor gauge field, where the gauge field transformation has a uh, one form. Uh, transformation parameter. So this has the subtlety that Subronil was uh, uh, mentioning. Okay, that even the transformation parameter uh, itself has a gauge transformation. Okay, so you need to be careful in counting the degrees of freedom. This also has eight plus eight optional degrees. Okay, and there is a special multiplet called the chiral multiplet. It has 16 plus 16 off shell degrees of freedom. Okay. I will not discuss this multiplet so much in the lecture, except that it is called the chiral multiplet because it's lowest component, okay, which is A, okay, which has the lowest wave weight. And this transformation is chiral, right? Because it only is, it only goes to epsilon upper i and not epsilon lower i. And this is why it is called as the chiral multiplet. Okay. And it has a highest component, okay, which is also chiral called C. Okay. And in flat space, okay, all these multiplets, if you turn off conformal supergravity fields, they are flat space supersymmetry multiplets. 
Okay, and in flat space, it goes to a total derivative. Okay. Now, epsilon is space space time independent in flat space, like in uh, rigid supersymmetry. Okay. Therefore, this C is used as an action. Okay. You can write L is equal to d four x. Okay, C. Okay. I mean, uh, in flat space. Okay. In rigid space. Now you could ask why is it useful? It goes to a total uh, derivative anyway. But what happens is that one can express C okay or uh, yeah, one can express C in terms of other fields. For example, C might be some function of scalar fields in the vector multiplet or something like that. Okay, it will be a more complicated function than that, but ba basically, it might be some dynamical comp composite object comprising of some other multiplet fields. Okay, and when that happens, you get a new action for that multiplet. Okay, so this this is the technique that is used. Okay, have an action for one multiplet. Embed another multiplet inside and get the action. Okay. And since these are optional multiplets which are not tied to any particular action, you can do this process. You can embed one multiplet inside that. Okay. So in supergravity, you have this action which is C minus epsilon ij psi bar i mu gamma mu lambda j and so on, where all these terms. Are added to address additional terms in supergravity. Okay. So in flat space, it goes to it directly goes to a total derivative. Okay. Whereas in supergravity, it goes to a derivative total. You know, uh, it goes to a covariant derivative of this field. Okay. And of course, there is this parameter, right? And when you take the in integration by parts, now this parameter is space-time dependent. So that will have some epsilon. Uh, that will have some del mu epsilon. Okay. So to cancel that, there are some gauge field terms that are needed, like this. Okay. And there are also other terms needed because of uh, the technical details of chiral multiplet in supergravity. So the first time this formula was constructed, so this is called as a density formula. It was constructed in this way. They began with C, which was invariant under flat supersymmetry, okay, and they added the additional supergravity fields to make it super uh, supergravity invariant, okay, an invariant in supergravity, okay. Because once you turn off all the gravity supergravity fields, it should be a supersymmetry action anyway, in rigid space, okay. And this is called as a density formula because you can embed other multiplets into this formula. So that is what I will do next. But are there any questions? Okay. So what what becomes important for this embedding is that, for example, consider the vector multiplet. Okay. If you take this A, which is the uh, lowest veil weight component in the chiral uh, multiplet, okay, you could realize it by using this x square, where this is from the vector multiplet. So begin with this mapping. Okay. And by supersymmetry transformation, you will realize that you can map every other fields. So the resulting action that you will get once you take the supersymmetry transformation and substitute it here, okay, then substitute it back to chiral density formula, whatever is the embedding, right? A will appear in some term in the chiral density formula. Substitute x square there, okay, and in other places substitute whatever is whatever you need, okay, 
and what you will finally get is a kinetic action for vector multiplet in conformal supergravity. Okay, so this way of constructing the action for one multiplet and embedding another multiplet inside this, okay, to get the action for that multiplet is called a super conformal ten tensor calculus. Okay, this is extremely useful because all these are compensator multiplets and they will give you new Poincare supergravity invariants. Okay, so that is the usefulness of this technique. Are there any I'm questions? Up, uh yeah i have a question so yeah. uh, so if i understand correctly what you did was you took the uh, uh, a particular field in the chiral multiplet yeah which was invariant in rigid susi yeah and then now you want it to be invariant under super gravity also and yeah. you add these compensating terms and these yeah. compensating terms uh, you are not picking from any particular multiplet right i mean you're just uh, seeing how i mean whatever is required uh, from particular multiplet, what what we will do is that using this x field, we will uh -huh. gauge fix the UNR symmetry and dilatation. Uh, before you even reach the x field, when you wrote down the density formula, then there is no such. It's just a formula. Okay, only it's when just you a formula. Oh, because it's it is algebraic in chiral multiplet fields, right? It is almost useless as just a formula for this chiral multiplet. Okay. Right. Now within this chiral multiplet, you can either embed another chiral chiral multiplet because chiral multiplet admits fields of, with many combination of veil veil weights. Okay, like okay, there is a okay, chiral okay. multiplet where A is veil weight uh, two. Okay? okay, there is a chiral multiplet where A is veil weight one. Okay, and in fact that okay. other chiral multiplet A cap is this X. Okay, mapping. Okay, okay? and this is called as restricted chiral multiplet. Okay. So you could also okay. embed that restricted chiral multiplet in this, and maybe that will give some some more physics. Okay, but for the chiral okay. multiplet itself, it is not very useful. Once you embed the vector multiplet, you get an action okay. for the vector multiplet. Once you okay. have an action for the vector multiplet, that is like our scalar field action in conformal gravity, which will give you some Poincaré gravity action. Okay, okay, okay. So when you when you say that you want to embed another multiplet into the existing multiplet, uh, so mm -hmm. all the derivative terms are coming from the embedding. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because you know okay. x x x transformation will have some uh -huh. derivatives of other fields. Ah, okay, 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 I see, I see. Okay, so that will introduce dynamics. Like other fields will be combination of uh, time derivatives of these fields. I mean, space time I derivatives see, of these fields. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, I have four minutes, it seems like. So now, okay, so this will give you action for various multiplets and this is a, and this density formula, okay, there is this density formula and there is another density formula called as linear vector density formula. Okay, so there is chiral density formula. There is linear vector density formula. And last year, Bindusar and I constructed a new density formula, new fermionic density formula. Okay. These are three density formulas that are available in conformal supergravity. Okay. And each of these formulas are based on some multiplets. Okay. You embed other multiplets inside these multiplets and obtain the action for, for those other multiplets. Okay. And use them as compensating multiplets. Is that okay? Okay. And what is usually done, uh, the most popular choice is the chiral density formula, where you choose A as F of X. Okay. Uh, so, so this is a more general embedding than the one before. And there are some additional constraints on this F of X, which I won't discuss. This F of X is called as the prepotential. And in fact, you can even consider n vector multi okay, uh, n vector multiplets, okay, where i runs from zero to n, where zeroth one is the compensator compensating one, and every other one, one to n, is dynamic. Okay, these are matter multiplets in Poincaré supergravity. Zeroth one is a compensator. Okay, and you can use this uh, the action that you obtain from this. Okay as the uh, as the action in conformal supergravity okay 
Is that clear? So I will just write the gauge fixing. So the gauge fixing we use is that there is always a vector multiplet compensator. Okay, I'll stop in one or two minutes. Okay, where we set x and x bar to one. Okay, so this gauge fixes so x being set equal to x bar gauge fixes u one r symmetry. Right, because if this this has one chiral weight, the complex conjugate has the opposite chiral weight. Okay, so if both of them are equal, it gauge fixes u one r, and this gauge fixes dilatation. Just like earlier, okay. And like earlier, we said B mu is equal to zero. This fixes K transformation. And omega i is equal to zero. Fixes S sus. Okay. So everything is gauge fixed, except the except the SU two R symmetry. Okay. and there is some other technical difficulty which is also related okay and this we will discuss next time so one compensating multiplet is not enough weil plus vector we have so far it has 32 plus 32 offshell degrees of freedom this is not enough we need another compensating multiplet we will begin our le next lecture with the discussion of this another compensating multiplet okay how this gauge fixing is done completely how one obtains a theory of poincare supergravity that will take some 10 15 minutes so after that we will see how the technique we have employed to uh, derive this new density formula okay but i won't derive this new density formula here i will probably present it in low energy uh, talks on high energy physics okay but uh, i will derive the i will tell you the steps on how to derive the already well known chiral density formula using the approach used here this is called a superform approach it was more common in super space but it was systematized in a component approach by uh, bernard david uh, bindusar uh, daniel butter and francis seri okay when they constructed the n is equal to 4 supergravity action okay which was not constructed for some 20 30 years uh, this superform approach helped them to construct it okay so we will use this approach which is very general approach to construct density formulas and see how we can construct a well known chiral density form okay that is the plan for next lecture if i have time i will give a very fast introduction to solution preserving supersymmetry okay. are there questions okay first let us thank subbu for this excellent lecture if there are any pressing question please unmute yourself and ask otherwise we will pause the recording and then you can ask more informally so one thing i want to tell people who might be dissuaded by the level of technicality of this lecture which is that in the next lecture after like doing another gauge fixing the superform approach will involve some uh, general physics ideas which may be interesting for many people like how to coordinateize gauge symmetry and obtain gauge invariant actions basically that is the question we will ask any any pressing questions i have a question yeah uh, so the chiral density formula that you wrote yeah so uh, uh, correct me if i'm wrong so yeah. uh, is it based on the fact that this uh, highest uh, highest component of the multiplet which is c this yeah. uh, uh, the transformation of this component uh, is a total derivative yeah yeah In is flat, this the only thing yeah in flat space it was based on total uh, was total derivative plus some corrections in supergravity which is why there are these correction terms uh, okay but in flat space for uh, every multiplet the highest weight component transforms as a total derivative yeah so that may be possible but you know like the advantage here is that chiral multiplet uh, can exist for many whale weights okay like the whale weight is like arbitrary in for chiral multiplet okay or okay, okay even in flat space i can answer so another way to think about it is that chiral you can embed other multiplets inside the chiral multiplet okay that is why it is more interesting because if you could write any total derivative mm -hmm. i mean anything that transforms to a total derivative but will it admit you know like some uh, 
uh, some kinetic terms of some fields uh, that is the question okay but in principle if we follow this procedure we can write uh, this kind of a formula or this kind of a supergravity action for any multiple yeah yeah what happens is that there are not many multiplets and chiral multiplet is large enough okay to contain other multiplets there are not many large multiplets known like in the density formula that bindusar and i constructed there was some other multiplet called real scalar multiplet which which had 24 plus 24 components so matter multiplet that also could contain other multiplet so that so we use that to write okay. down write down the density formula okay thank you yeah okay so perhaps let me stop the recording and then people oh if there is a question please go on yeah so i would ask that uh, i mean uh, in four dimension uh, can you classify all the super gravity action and not and general maybe a general question no i mean uh, of course the minimal super gravity actions are all classified uh, in the, in this uh, paper by in 19 uh, Uh, in 1983 uh, by bernard david and others there is some a paper called improved tensor multiplet in four dimensions that is all the minimal poincare supergravity actions uh, classified which has like two derivative actions but higher derivative actions we know for example what is the bosonic term like for example if you if you ask like what is the supersymmetric completion of weyl square or ricci square okay and we know that there are only two such terms in gravity and the, that will have a supersymmetric completion but once we have like matter coupled supergravities there might there might be many uh, differences in like various invariants so i don't know of a classification okay. for for instance in d uh, d equal to 11 i mean 11 dimensions um, yeah i think uh, lavendi supergravity is unique it is a yeah. unique unalterable theory but the point mm -hmm. is that you you can do compactifications of lavendi supergravity okay mm -hmm. and we think of all the supergravities as coming from there but okay. that is not always the most simplest way to get the supergravity in 4d that is why mm -hmm. these methods exist okay yeah yes. Okay so let me stop the recording and then people can uh, continue the, the discussions more informally